Hello everybody, I hope you're doing well today. Thank you, Kelpie Shum and Daddy for sure. You're both also doing well. Let's I guess chat briefly. Or you know what, I could I could jump into the guide technically. So let's talk about I have a little tall window for now, we don't need those. Let's talk about the intent of today's video. So one thing that I feel is important to know, especially if you're playing on Affinia, is all about trading. So we're gonna go... We're gonna take it a little slower to go through things like the price guide and give you some examples of things that are happening in Affinia now. Uh, but the main intent of the guide after that is to go through an item for item breakdown uh, categorized in categories such as starter kit, your support items, your armor and shield options, um, if you're struggling with the boss, maybe some boss optimization items. Otherwise, uh, for the most part, uh, I would say at least 70% of the items talked about today are more geared towards like setting up a new character. But we do have a section for people that are assuming at least level 180. Uh, if you're looking to figure out what true endgame looks like and maybe all the other guides with the tons and tons of items to hunt for don't give you a good sense of you know, what, what is specifically meant for endgame. Hopefully this will tidy it up a little bit. So I guess we'll go through little bits of the guide at a time. So just to note, if you see hit percentages at any point in the guide, those are basically the minimum recommended percentages. Uh, you can obviously go much higher, but as we're about to go over by looking at the Affinia's official price guide, which exists by the way, uh, there are really big gaps in the cost to get certain items. So your one or two PD pickup might be literally 100 PDs, 200 PDs, or photon drops. So just be aware there's a very big gap between what I would consider kind of like the starter kit or the budget items and like true endgame hunts. I just want to draw that distinction early. So I actually want to take a look at, before we continue on with the guide, uh, a little section known as the price guide. So this is more specific to Affinia, but this gives you an idea of, you know, what items are trading for. I'm not going to associate prices with each item because market price fluctuates all the time. I don't feel that is the most useful thing to do, but I feel like if you want to, you can then compare whatever item you're looking for from this list with the price guide if you're playing Affinia. Otherwise, again, that's really up to you how it gets traded. So let's go ahead and jump into that. If he says prices are as low as high as they're willing to wait to make the trade, exactly. We have the price guide opened up here. So just be aware that in Affinia, for the most part... Mm, excuse me a second, chat, as I resize so you can read the rest of it. We'll ignore chat for a little bit. Sorry, chat. Uh, I don't think this is going to fit on the page. That's unfortunate. Give me one second. I have a slightly better option. I didn't realize it didn't scroll like the other page did. One moment, chat. Hmm. Actually, you know what? I don't think this matters for what I'm looking to review. Yeah, I don't think this matters because you can still see what I wanted to talk about. Let's scroll down slightly. Let's not get hung up on that. So most of the time you'll end up coming across the table where essentially you have a hit percentage range for whatever weapon you're looking at. So for example, like really common support items might involve, um, you know, potentially things like Demon's Hell, Charge. And you can see like some of these are worth like maybe a quarter of a photon drop, but on like the large end of the scale, <laughs> It's worth 30 to 35. And this is just for like a common drop kind of item. You'll notice as we get into things like ray guns. I mean, look at this price difference from today's market. A 75% berserk handgun, so 75% hit, is <laughs> estimated between 900 and 1300 EDs. So just be aware, there is a very wide distance in terms of how much hit percentage will change a cost of an item, and I feel like this is probably one of the better <laughs> examples to show off. So, 
Uh, I just want to talk very briefly why there is such a disparity. Generally speaking, higher hit percentage rarer, but what's more common is that for 45 and 50 hits, or more specifically 50% actually, there's a very common quest in episode 4 called Restless Lion, and or people are able to purchase items with 50% hit from the shop once they hit a certain level. So these will generally be very cheap on the pickup range. The hunted items, which are only going to come from locations like Tower, Seabed, maybe parts of Ruins. Yeah, I don't have the exact level. I, that's one of those things I wish was exposed. If chat has a source for that, by all means, please post in the chat and we'll take a look at that. But I could not find it prior to this guide. Uh, a, a specific number. Uh, to Affinia as well, because I've saw ones for other PSO and I don't know how accurate that is for Affinia. Uh, so, generally speaking, people will be able to pick up very easy 50 hits. So, even though it is a phenomenal amount of accuracy to add to your character, I mean, adding if a literal 50% chance on your first normal strike, and then it scales up higher in the combo, is fantastic for a majority of the characters. Uh, similarly, uh, for the most part, worse weapons aren't really recommended, so you're not going to see a lot from there. I would say from the standpoint of alternate items, which we're not going to go into as much, but just be aware that these exist. If you're looking to make trades for things that are in Clear Steel 5, or you happen to notice that these components are here as you play and you're looking to make a, a sale, you can get a decent price for these. So Clear Steel 5 will just be a combination of random items. Let's just briefly open this. It's a brief reminder for people that may or may not know what this is. Um, if you combine a series of rare items and common items, you can form a, a stronger item. Now, the big draw, I would say for the most part, <clears throat> would probably be the Book of Katana items, Mercurius Rod, and maybe PB Increase. The others, I would say, are more fringe. I'm not sure as many people will jump onto them. And maybe some people will go for the God Shield Kiryu components as well. So just be aware that there is a certain list of items you can pick up in PSO. Even though by themselves they're quite terrible, they could be useful in clear as deal ones. Now something I didn't see in here in particular in the price guide, and maybe they'll update it by the time this goes live, there are a series of items for plating. So for example, um, if you go through and you want to get new looks for an item called the Red Ring, you will need to do a certain pickup, and those items will generally involve uh, kind of what I'll call off rares, like rares that are normally quite terrible and nobody uses for standard play. Nine times out of ten will go into one of these items. So just be aware that that exists. And in theory, you could also make additional PDs from those kinds of trades. So definitely take a look at that in Aphinia's, um little guide list. I'm gonna see if I can pop it open for you. Let's actually see if it's also here. Oh, they do have it. Okay, they just put it under Linings. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I was about to go open up the quest one, and I'm like, wait a minute, it's actually here. So yeah, just be aware that uh, the individual components can sell for a lot. I mean, you could see, for example, just to get a Dell Saber plating, they're asking for 100 straight up. Prometheus says you can also make PDs by being Girl Scouts and selling me cookies. Halloween cookies are a big draw. A lot of event items will potentially go for big numbers. Let's see from this list what they're allegedly selling for. The Easter egg they put a uh, no price in, but more common drops from holiday ones would be the event eggs, which you get as you play. So technically, you could convert some of that currency into wreck PDs. I'm not going to say whether this is a good or a bad trade. It honestly really just depends on where you are in the game. See Halloween Cookie allegedly 4 to 5. Prometheus is the, is the baker. He has a lot of Halloween cookies. So just be aware that there are a lot of ways you could potentially get PDs. They're not all good. You might want to consider the alternate uses of these things. Like, for example, if you're not planning on changing the color of Red Ring or you don't have Red Ring, Picking one of these up during an event is pretty easy way to just get PDs, to be honest with you, especially if you get spare items. 
Uh, similarly, if you're going through, we talked about at the end of the previous guide, but there's a lot of heart of items that are found between very hard mode and ultimate. If you happen to pick these up and you are not interested in them, cosmetics tend to go for a lot of PDs. So if you're looking for ways to kind of get into the market, like selling one heart of like rabbit wand or even heart of Ismalia potentially will fuel your entire new character from one sale. So just be aware that it is worth checking out the list, even if the items are not of interest to you to trade for. If you happen to pick them up, it is worth potentially taking a look at this. Um, I'll make one more comment that even common items like grinders and materials, if they're sold in bulk, can end up netting you quite a lot of photon drops. So while not applicable necessarily to new players, uh, definitely for people with more than one character, it's not uncommon to end up with 99 power materials or 99 mine materials, uh, depending on where you're hunting and leveling, in particular if you're playing episode 4. So just be aware there's a lot of ways where you might incidentally collect all the PDs you need, even if they don't drop in actual PD form. Trading is really nice, it could get you potentially some nice mags, it could get you units. You can see for the most part, a lot of the support items are half a PD or less. So we're gonna, I think, transition over to uh, kind of on the side of things where we're gonna talk based mainly from the starting perspective. I don't think there's anything else I'm really missing from this list. Oh, I'll mention one thing. So if an item is perfectly min stat or perfectly max stat, sometimes it will go for higher price just because people like to collect these items. Uh, but generally speaking, if you're looking for a defensive gear, the higher defense, the more expensive. If it's exact perfect, that's where you potentially go into things like auctions. So I'll give an example of an auction before we go into uh, the guide itself. So just be aware that on the Affinia forums, uh, there is a tab specifically for auctions, with the idea being that there's a, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you want to set the starting price, what is the minimum that it should be, uh, you give a courtesy number of hours potentially before you close the auction. So for example, every time somebody puts in a bid, you wait two days and it extends it as long as people are bidding. But potentially, depending on what uh, activities are in the forums, if you think an item can sell for quite a lot more, uh, when in doubt, just ask the trading group and then also potentially just set up something like an auction. Finally, I'll give a special shout out to Hellcleave, so a little, little Hellcleave shout out. So some people have stores outside of uh, the Discord itself. Make sure if you're on Affinia, you can either go to the Affinia Discord server directly or check out trade lists. They're usually updated in real time. If you're looking to compare against a few different people uh, that are making sales, just be aware you could shop around. But also be aware that if it's an endgame item, it's probably going to be a lot harder to attain just because there might not be as many people selling it. So just be aware of those things as you go into uh, the training itself, whether you're a buyer or seller. I think we covered basically what I wanted to cover in the beginning. Let's continue on, Moritz. Also, as a reminder, if you haven't seen the other guides in this guide itself, which we'll be sharing down below the video description or within the uh, Twitch Discord itself, and or, or yeah, Twitch and or Discord itself. I have links to all the guides, so they should all reference each other in case you want to take a look at some of the items that maybe you don't feel like hunting them and you want to compare uh, potentially some pricing or you're looking to compare some loadouts. They're all here for you to easily reference, and that's all I'll say on that, re on that matter. So, I would say for the most part, I did have a lot of trouble getting a specific order of items, and I'm sure there will be disagreement as to the order of which you get some of these items. But here is my basic philosophy as we go through and we get these different ones. So... Actually, I don't even see it for Hunter. So one thing that I kind of go back and forth on is where to get certain items like a mag. I feel like mags are very powerful. I'm probably going to put it... I'm gonna put it right here so I'm gonna just double check I feel like for the most part it is one of the first things you should get correct this a little bit 
we're gonna say, I'll call them the power level mags. So the intent of these is to make sure, like for example, you have your 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 five defense, 145 power, zero mind, or equivalency of like 45 decks, zero mind kind of things. These kinds of things will enable you to use a lot of the stronger items, and more often than not, accuracy is not necessarily the first thing that you grab, but it is useful once you have items that would benefit from the accuracy. So for example, if you're just starting off the game, it's probably more beneficial to have roll ATP, so that way you kill with literally everything that you have. From there, it'll scale your equivalency of shift to D-bands. Um, I split up Gel and Zalur because honestly, unless you're kind of in the... Unless you're an ultimate, you're not really going to be using it as much. First few PD should always go to a level mag, exactly. So I would say, arguably, like, if you only had, like, one PD, for example, I would say Heavenly Battle is probably your first pickup. <laughs> then the cookies, I don't know about that for me. <laughs> but I think, at least from the standpoint, attack speed is so crucial uh, for hunters. So for those that aren't aware of what this item, item does, it's a unit that increases your attack speed by 40%. It's just leaps and bound better than everything. It basically acts as a big multiplier for the rest of the character. It's also a very cheap pickup. It's usually one or less, uh, depending on uh, the trade that you're in. So definitely take a look at that to get you started. Once you have the basics of all this power, honestly, if you didn't, if you couldn't afford anything else, you could probably just very easily clear all the way to ultimate with the combination of these things. Uh, but be aware that if you are below level 80 at the time of trading, uh, you will have to pick up something like a mind mag or something else, which we put into one of the uh, situational items uh, later on in the guide. So just be aware. It depends on your level whether or not you need it. Technically, you don't need it. Most of these don't have a huge requirement, but if for whatever reason you're like super fresh, just be aware that anything involving techniques will probably need a mind mag to learn early if you're looking especially to get it before level 80 uh, one of these techniques just be aware of that then i think every hunter has basically the same kind of setup for i would say kind of clearing everything so before you get really deep into ultimate for example uh, classic items would be a 50 hit charge Vulcan, so for those that don't know what that is, let's just pop it up in the corner so that way you can reference what the item is. One moment. So for the most part, unless it's a rare weapon, I'm just gonna leave it in the bottom right hand corner. There's not really too much to say about this other than it's your end game mech gun, but the fact that it has a special, like, charge is just very very strong technically it can be other types of things so i guess i should specify i don't think i would recommend making this spirit you could get away with charger berserk since eventually later on um your character will rely on reducing their own health so i think from the perspective of hunters it's definitely a 50 50 which one is more useful depending on what other items you acquire i do think the charge ray gun or berserk I think also technically is better, are fine pickups for most characters general preference is to always go for charge but if you have an alternative such as berserk sometimes it's useful i just wanted to mention that the so ray gun is just a very basic pistol not too much to say about this other than it's just a nice to have so we'll put it in the bottom right corner so these even though they're common weapons the fact that you're able to get them with 50 hit as well as a special that greatly increases your damage means that more often than not this will completely outpower uh, most early game rares and honestly to some extent even some of the end game rares so if you combine that with a decent mag decent stats uh, you will basically be deleting everything in the game and these are not very expensive pickups again they're in the range of one PD or less, with the exception of the mag, which might be for four plus, depending on what kind of mag you're getting. So again, not very expensive in terms of creating an alternate character, yet the quality of life difference is crazy. So just be aware that I'm just going to go through the different item types here. So I would say from that standpoint... Ooh. 
this here, actually. I like that a little better. So I kind of have a general category of which AoE to pick up. You could either go for a spear or the giant sword. So the Gunnier, I like on some characters more than others, just due to the attack animation. Oh, Murphy bringing up a good point, actually. So, definitely, uh, the reason you want to go for more of what we call the standard power mag of 145 power, and let me also specify that, in case people question what this is. Yeah, let me, let me just do this. So you generally want to get minimum defense on a mag. You want the power score to be fairly high. But it's also important that you add a little bit of accuracy, because if you can't land attacks then there's no point to having all the power. So something like a 45 dex mag, which gives approximately its number divided by 2 in attack accuracy, will result in you being able to equip things like uh, guns sooner, which is surprisingly important for being able to, uh, I would say, carry in those kinds of games. And in addition, uh, accuracy becomes more and more important as your power gets higher. So while you you have other means of raising your ATP, uh, aside from the mag, it's much harder to raise your accuracy. So just be aware that this is more of an intended balance loadout from the standpoint of newer characters. I'm gonna copy this for later. So my, my suggestion is to, just depending on your character type, I, I usually prefer Spear no matter what, but that's kind of a bias. Caliber is useful on male characters, for example. Uh, Gunnier is just kind of a universal option and it can be used for rangers. But for me, I always prefer the, uh, the Spear for that, even if it's not quote unquote optimal. But technically the sword hits a lot of targets and it has higher ATP. So just be aware that it can result in bigger damage, which results in combo killing a little more consistently, hitting the same targets. However, the range of the sword is not quite the same as the spear, so it's much wider than it is uh, forward in range. So, there, so if in doubt, you can get both. They're not very expensive. But also just be aware that um, female characters can upgrade this later on, so don't go too crazy with this. Would be my, my advice there. So finally, I'll just I'll just show in the bottom right-hand corner of the slicer. We're not going to bother showing this, I think, going forward. So if I skim over it in the future sections, it's because we've just covered the item, which will happen for a couple of the classes. The slicers are universal, which is kind of nice. If we specifically go to Diska and make sure that I emphasize this the right item type there, uh, then you will have the ability to do AOV damage very quickly. So by having at least one close range weapon that deals with groups, a disca to hit far targets, and a gun to single target damage, preferably Vulcan before Ray Gun, but Ray Gun is more useful for bosses like Falls due to distance. This will basically cover you through 80% of your gameplay through Ultimate. Honestly, you could probably just clear all the way to the end of the game <laughs> using only these four. Uh, weapon categories, I guess the best way to put it, where it technically gives you everything you need to deal with bosses early on, technically. Uh, but we'll cover later on how to optimize that and pick better uh, choices for bigger damage. Now we have something I like to call the Attack Accuracy Starter Pack. So just be aware that Heavenly Arms is a unit that provides 25 accuracy to your character. All characters can use this. This is a great item to kind of trade between your characters, especially if you're leveling more than one. So basically by going very heavily into the power mag, plus later on getting nothing but luck and power materials, this kind of balances out your uh, power curve very nicely. So that's just the general recommendation as you go to play. Smart Link is a little more complicated to explain, so I'll pop this up briefly. But essentially it's a unit that only applies to hunters and forces. The intent being that hunters and forces get an attack penalty depending on how far away they are. So for example, the max distance of a mech gun uh, will result in up to a 28% penalty. The max distance of a handgun will be up to a minus 56 penalty chance of hitting. So just be aware that Smart Link will eventually outscale most things. However, if you truly are not looking to do any ranged attacks, which I don't super recommend, but maybe there's quests that don't need you to do that, 
Uh, potentially swapping in a fourth heavenly arm to focus on melee is good. But generally speaking, endgame PSO is about a good mixture of ranged weapons and if able to be in the right position at the, at the right time, uh, swap to melee to combo kill things. So having that quote unquote starter pack will just assure that you're basically able to do whatever you want. Essentially what'll happen is that you will be equipping the Heavenly Battle and either three Heavenly Arms or two Heavenly Arms and a Smart Link, depending on what you're doing there. And again, if you're playing mostly point blank, it might be more useful to stay with the Heavenly Arms. If you're looking to do more range sniping, like let's say you're fighting falls or something, uh, that's where it's really good to keep a Smart Link on you, because that actually makes more of a difference than the Heavenly Arm does, believe it or not. So then, just kind of wrapping up the Hunter here, debuff techniques are only really important once you're in the higher areas. I see Murphy is making a comment. Let's read what Murphy has to say. Card just get 50 hit or just get brain mana or similar price, but just get brain mana comes with 13 to get 30 hit. This might be worth your time, but i Exactly. So these are just kind of very generic shareable items, but there are really strong options to replace these. So while Charge Disca is very cheap, we'll be talking about, uh, we'll call more optimized items as we go forward in the list. Don't worry, Murphy, we cover that. <laughs> so these are like the, the, the low as you can go items before you can get into the other things. So what I would recommend after you complete your uh, capping of materials, again, the cap depends on what uh, race your character is, whether you're a cast Newman or etc. You need a high ATP item. So you could get away with Excalibur or Galatine if you're non-cast, if you don't know what that means. We're gonna take a look very briefly at the Excalibur. So this is an item that typically requires uh, unsealing. It has a pretty high minimum ATP requirement. So this is not something you're going to pick up right away over the other choices, but if you're approximately, let's say, 110, 120 into the game, uh, most characters can use it, assuming they're using power materials in the mag by this point. Un unless, of course, they're a force. So the intent behind this item is that it's just a general boss kill item. It also has some synergy with an item called B801, which allows for fast casting, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, but more importantly, this is just kind of your generic beat stick. So eventually you're going to sub out some of the other items with Excalibur. And again, the situation you use it in is generally Excalibur will be your boss killer early on for different reasons. And kind of similarly, we have an item called the Galatine. It has a slightly steeper requirement, but has a higher ATP total. However, this is single target, the Excalibur is capable of hitting up to three targets, so just be aware there's uses for both of these items. These tend to be a bit more expensive on the scale. I would say this is kind of like the fringe of the end of the starter kit and more of like the mid-tier items. But I think the value you get out of these makes it a worthwhile a little more than other ones. Similarly, if you're looking to just play a supporting role, arguably I could put this in the support slash add-on. I do feel like V501 is almost mandatory with these characters, so just be aware that, generally speaking, if you're not playing a cast, these items will be, I would say, borderline mandatory, and even if you are playing cast, uh, just being able to more consistently land something uh, in terms of paralysis and of those nature, I feel is worth picking up and dealing with the enemy. So we'll talk about V501. Uh, that's fine, we don't have to go into more details. So we already talked about ray guns, Arrest is just the strongest version of Paralysis. I'll briefly open up the Kunai, which is something you can potentially easily get as you play. And as I said before, a lot of these items potentially you might be picking up on other characters, so it's more of a, what do I need to get the other character started? And just making sure that you purchase whatever you can, or you farm whatever you don't feel like spending PVs on. So again, up to discretion here. Kunai is a great universal item. I like it for its arrest uh, paralysis. If you could get it with a little bit of hit, great. It's useful with like pretty much a minimum of 15 on most characters, to be honest. Welcome, Dango. And it also has the ability to hit the Dub Witches. So it's just kind of a utility item that shuts down groups or allows you to triple focus an arrest due to the fact that the third hit in the Kunai string uh, will triple hit a target or spread as like a kind of a mini shotgun spread. 
on a few close range targets. So pretty much an invaluable tool, super easy pickup, not really hard to farm either. So just be aware these options exist. Um, I would say also if you have at least a V501, the reason I would also consider this part of the, the starter kit for characters is getting access to an early hell item. So you will be able to farm out a whole bunch of other things by just having a basic V50 unit uh, in terms of quests. So this could be things like clearing temple, spaceships, seabed runs, and so this is kind of like a budget version of what's considered endgame. And those new runs will allow you to get potentially more PDs or more item hunts for in the future. Murphy says something consider V501 is weaker the more enemy versus special, the cast bonus is stronger the more enemy versus special, but also traps exist. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of an interesting mix where paralysis is kind of your only real option to deal with a lot of these targets as a hunter. So it, it becomes pretty much mandatory, especially if playing solo, in order to deal with them. With the exception being if you're like a Hugh Cast or Hugh Casil, you have at least freeze traps and confuse traps to deal with enemies. So arguably you could delay the pickup of that item. However, casts do get the bonus to them, so they become more or less invaluable. So if you are a low-level character and you're looking to assist in certain runs, having a V501 hell gun and a rest ray gun is kind of ridiculous. So just be aware that those are pretty much staples and you will be using these potentially to all the way to the end of the game. So you pretty much get your money's worth, quote unquote, with PDs. I'm also going to briefly mention the item Holy Ray, which is kind of a mix of early game and end game option depending on what uh, your stat line is. So be aware that hunters don't have access to a lot of sniper range weapons, which is a two den, uh, two den, excuse me, horizontal distance within Aphinia's sight. So this is an item you may or may not pick up as you play, because it can be picked up, for example, in green ID early uh, versus worm boss. But it potentially has the ability to act as a very ranged variant of a seize item. But also be aware, minimum MST makes this a little difficult to use. Just keep an eye out for it. Sometimes you luck into it and they're not too bad. 50 hit arrest ray gun plus V501 plus cast basically means you cannot you can't not paralyze something with SSS. Yeah, pretty much. So being able to shut down those enemies makes it just so much easier to climb. Whether you're in multiplayer or single player to be honest. Now we have ones where this is kind of more of a miscellaneous ones where I think they're strong, but depending on what you're doing, they're a bit more skippable. So again, this is a very subjective categorization. I could see people arguing for stuff to be moved. I view this as like a very strong starter kit. This is a perfect thing to get after you have all of your quote unquote, I guess, core items. So for cast specifically, as well as humor. Actually, pretty much everybody except for Hugh World. Let me correct that statement. There's an item called S Red Blade. So this item is pretty important to get. Wait a second. There we go, it's just being finicky. So basically by using its special attack, you're able to cast shift and D-band on yourself. This is just kind of free stats as uh, the Humar, Hucas, and Hucaseal don't have the ability to do so. So it's just kind of minor optimization. If you're truly desperate, then from the standpoint of climbing single player, or if you're in bad party comps, this is going to be one of your only ways to buff your own character as those uh, classes. Just be aware that option exists. If you don't play a lot of solo play, I would say this is a little less valuable. That's why I don't put it as highly in the other category. So it also depends on what uh, character type you are. Another classic one for human characters are demon ray guns, which reduce the enemy's health uh, by one to one quarter. So if the enemy has 100 health and you hit them with demons, they get reduced down to 25. This is a fantastic item for more endgame areas. You won't be using it early on, so I would say you can delay when you pick up this item. However, if you if your focus is more endgame content, I would say feel free to raise the priority of this higher than the others. And finally, we have an alternative to the Demon Ray Gun, which allows for multi-hits. 
that in the corner for you. So this one is just a really fantastically, honestly kind of broken slicer. So a lot of characters, including Forest, including Ranger, will be using this item to cheese a lot of targets due to the fact that if you do a normal attack, or excuse me, if you do a special attack and then do a normal attack before the special attack hits, you do something known as the SN or the SNS accuracy glitch, depending on what combo you're using, which means that your second hit will be extremely accurate even... or your special will be extremely accurate because it uses your second attack's accuracy. So that can lead to some very silly, almost guaranteed hits of Demon. The fact that this can then bounce to two other targets means that multi-part creatures like Gurdabulu in Episode 4 get absolutely deleted, or it just gives you more chances on small groups of enemies to basically devastate them. So this is a very strong option. You might not be able to use it in every situation, so it's not bad to have a Demon Ray Gun backup. In particular, if the enemy is very aggressive and on you already, you might not be able to shake them off as a Humar, for example, or even necessarily a Hugh World. So just be aware that this is a really solid pickup. It's usually not that expensive. You don't even need hit with it for the most part because of the fact that you can glitch it. But if you do get it with hit percentage, it's always nice. Might be clarifying that level 3 shift is 12.6% attack increase, which is significant on Hunters, exactly. So the name of the game is being able to put things within combo kill range as quickly as possible. So by focusing on that combination of mag plus materials for damage with a little bit of luck potentially to crit in order to get your damage higher, you're going to be able to clear runs faster just from the sheer fact that you're no longer being hit, combo kills make you safe, and you're able to basically control the battlefield, which is not something hunters can easily do without like a V5 unit, unless they're a cast, then they do whatever they want. Ca cats don't play by that rule, they don't care. So we have another great support item here that is useful, especially if you're climbing, regardless of single player or multiplayer, and that is Twin Blaze. So this is the only way for casts, uh, ranger or hunter, to use Gafoey. So this is just basically used as a reminder to stop targets from dive bombing you. It can be used for box opening if you're doing box runs. It is okay ATP, so honestly it could even potentially be used as a beat stick, depending on what its attributes are. It's just kind of a solid universal option. Um, the higher you go in level, the more likely it is to be used only for the Kafoe. But honestly, don't sleep on the fact that it potentially has a damage range of up to 520, which is a lot better than most items around that same category. Skirasol is not that far off, I think it's within 30 ATP comparatively. So just be aware that that exists. Then I'm gonna push two female items in particular, that I feel like are such quality of life items that they almost break the game, depending on how you use them. I can spell Vivian right. We'll try again. There we go. Let's extend the box out a little bit. So from that perspective, this is just a stronger version of the Double Saber. I do want to make note though, it can be used on a whole bunch of other characters. So this is a great item to potentially share between all of your female characters, whether they're Force, Ranger, or Hunter. And the raw damage of this can kind of make up for the fact that they don't have the same ATP values as their male counterparts. So sometimes that damage is just so ridiculous. Yeah, so most of the time, especially for characters like the Hugh Seal, they have exceptionally good animations with these items that will result in them basically out DPSing nearly every item in the game, despite like minimal ATP differences. So it's just a very solid uh, gender specific weapon that can be used cross class and will delete most enemies. So while you might not be able to combo kill with something like a charged ray gun, for example, this just brings in so much raw ATP that it's just basically over. So just be aware of that. One second, chat. But yeah, that item is just so overwhelmingly powerful that there's kind of no reason to not pick it up. Chat saying, Rumarl with Last Swan is just busted. Oh, we haven't talked about that yet. Let's go ahead and open that up now.
you know, hopefully, hopefully the sound, let me know, chat, if the song sounds a little odd. It sounds like it's only coming out of one speaker on my side. Just let me know and I'll restart the song rather than play it like this the whole time. Uh, but we have Last Swan, which is a fantastic handgun. Damage-wise, not the highest for handguns. However, it has the ability to hit three times. So a lot of the times it just means that your normal Heavy Heavy, for example, will hit nine total shots, which is a lot of application of your attack power, which is extremely, extremely powerful. So this will scale pretty much one. Okay, it is only coming out on the stream. Let me reset it. Whatever. Blame blame the uploader on that one. I thought it was my side. <laughs> Actually, not my fault that time. But yeah, this weapon is just a fantastic pickup. Honestly, it's just kind of like the instant pickup. I love it for popping things like the spinners, or I believe they're called Darvins in the Falls fight. Honestly, you could use this weapon almost start to finish. It's not as optimal necessarily as a charge item, but its speed and utility cannot be understated. Darvin is the proper name, nice. I was gonna say, I have, I have never paid attention to names of monsters. I'm always like, what was it called? Unless I'm hunting it, my brain doesn't maintain it. But yeah, this thing is just so good. Yeah, the fact that it's this it's the same as like the pistol range is pretty good, because 170 is the standard pistol range. But the fact that you have a mech gun at pistol range means you can use it against bosses that normally stay a bit further back. And this means, for example, if Ogaflow is being mean and is dashing around the arena, or if Falls is being mean and spinning around the arena, uh, both of these options will still hit, where the mech guns might not. So just be aware that these are also potentially your boss weapons for female characters, on top of just being really good for general early clear, if you're looking to save some money on your charge items. That's all I wanted to mention there. Let's scroll down a little further, talk about our armor options. So, I try to categorize them in a way that hopefully you can make a decision with this. So we have some people that only care about the speed at which you go through the telepipes and they're tired of something known as the slingshot effect. So you can put on something like the stealth suit, which gives you no defense, <laughs> essentially. No resistance is literally, but really high evasion. So if you're looking to just reduce that annoying slingshot effect, or you're just looking to very quickly go through telepipes because of the fact that you're already partially transparent, it causes you to take them faster, this is your option. It's not necessarily the best, but it can be useful if you're looking to do more kinds of speedrun things that don't involve the next item, which I would say is probably arguably a little better as an option, which is an armor known as 13. The other item required level 120 to use, 13. And most, sadly, I think most options do have a higher level limit. Thank you, Nate. So level 101, pretty bad resistances, except for dark. Dark, I think, is okay. Defense is okay. However, what this does, let me hide this is that it gives a very powerful bonus to Disco Great Man. It technically applies to other slicers, but we really just don't care about that in general. The only one that's really meta is Disco Great Man, because of the fact that it adds 50% of the weapon ATP. You ignore the attack speed because it doesn't stack with Heavenly Battle, and 30 accuracy. So being able to land special consistence consistently with this Disco of Brave Man, which I'm now popping up on the screen here, means you have a very solid ATP because you get 50% bonus here. On top of that, it's basically treating your Disco of Brave Man like it's a 30 hit weapon automatically, and you have the ability to apply Berserk, which is a damage multiplier for your weapons. So just really solid endgame. Most people will probably end up picking this over some of the other options. So I will still talk about other armor options, but arguably I guess this one's a little more meta. In fact, let me just move this one up a little higher. Just so that I don't confuse people, I guess, going forward. Yeah, so this is, this is one of those ones where when you're the right level, just immediately snap pick up a Disco Brave Man. Like, there's no reason to not do it. Otherwise, you could get away with Charge Disco if you're looking to do any of the other armor types. So just be aware of that. So, really fantastic combination when used together. The level requirement might mean that if you're looking as a fresh character, you might not be able to use it. So just be aware, please check out the level requirements of these armors. And that's why I put them lower and out of the starter kit, since a lot of these items 
do have quite a steep level requirement. Speaking of steep level requirement, let's talk about the item known as Blue Adoshi Violet Nimidao. So it has 156 defense, which is slightly off screen now, but that's fine. Um, but it has a level 150 requirement. So this basically lets you get away without using uh, an item called V101 or your Heavenly Battle. It's mostly just recommended for Hunu rolls. That's kind of like the meta choice because she is so stat hungry that she needs as much heavenly arms on her at all times in order to function that you are more than willing to give up decent uh, defense and get okay-ish resistances across the board. So I just wanted to mention this. This is like a great Hunu roll pickup, but most other people ex ignore that. Let's talk about some of the more, I would say, situational ones. Let's go into Sacred Claw. Ruffy says 30 hit is basically free, 40 hit is really cheap. I definitely recommend the combo, exactly. If you are able to get the armor, I highly recommend it. Sacred Cloth could be useful to basically free up another slot. If you're not looking to depend on Disco or Brave Man, uh, Having something to be immune to very annoying paralysis targets is an okay option, but be aware that it's generally not going to be as strong as some of the more risky options. This is just basically freeing up slots, which may or may not be useful to you. The next up we have Lieutenant Mantle. This one's a pretty solid option if you're not looking to focus on Disco, which I do recommend that you do. Just want to make it very clear. I've now moved it to the top, just for clarity. Um, but from the standpoint of being able to clear certain quests more easily, or if you're partnering with a cast buddy, sometimes you could kind of get in an agreement as to who should pop traps. Generally speaking, a ranger should do it. But be aware that this ability to see the traps in the first place has very high... Very high needs on the non-cast characters, as, especially if you're playing solo, unless you really want to carry around a whole ton of trap visions. Which is fair, but that does eat a slot in your inventory. Or, you just wear this and you deal with both your friend traps and enemy traps. It's not bad. I would say it depends on the quest how useful it is if you're playing solo play. There are quests where some of the trap counts are just completely bonkers. And there's other quests where you don't even see traps at all. So I would put that arguably maybe under the situational. Next up we have a fantastic early pickup for casts. So this one has a extremely low level requirement, so this might appeal to people that are not quite in ultimate, or honestly I still even use this on ultimate for rangers specifically. Uh, but hunters can wear this too. It's an armor that grants 35 attack power, and that is the only important stat on an entire armor. It it could grant zero defense, and it grants okay defense. It could grant zero resistances, and it gets pretty good light resistance. But uh, yeah, basically damage is king in this game. So being able to add additional sources of ATP from things like your armor and shield mean that if you have a weapon with any enemy attributes, so let's say you have, in theory, 100 native, your 35 attack power from the armor would be impacted by that, so it would go to 70 ATP total when considering your damage. So this can end up being several levels worth of damage and potentially upwards of 10 levels, uh, depending on how well geared you are. So this is just a kind of classic pickup if you're not specifically looking to slicer. As I said before, some runs really like the slicer, some necessarily don't. Welcome Loki, hope you're doing well. So just be aware there are alternatives, and this is something you might consider in a more generalized run. We'll leave it at that. For the purely defensive options, we have something known as the Blackhound Carace. It's, I would say, probably... probably lower on the priority. I put it lower on the list for this reason. It can be useful to not take damage from things. Uh, there are some annoying enemies as you climb through ultimate where you don't really care about slicer damage and you just don't want to die. So if you're getting really hardcore bullied at like mines or CCA or you're just looking to maybe survive some general hits uh, from high ATP creatures like a Gibbles or something, this potentially could be your option. Again, it's really up to player choice. 
I generally prefer to go kind of less cannony because I'm more used to the game. Newer players might find this more useful to just not get hard bullied out of certain areas earlier. So I would say discretion is advised with this. I wouldn't recommend this kind of armor in like forest or caves, for example. I would very much rather go ATP. But there are some annoying multi-strike enemies, including in areas like Seabed, where I know I'm basically not going to be using Disco Brave Man unless I am a really, really high level Hugh cast, for example. I would prefer to use demons or uh, alternate sources for damage otherwise with the other characters. I might benefit more from the raw defense of it. But also be aware that some enemies in later areas do a lot of insta-kill, so you might want to check out some other options to deal with them. And we're going to talk about probably the most popular one that's used in runs such as caves, or even surviving some of the nonsense of tower, to be honest. To be honest. Stat-wise, terrible defense, no level requirement, which is nice if you're looking to get a character started into ultimate, and 70 dark resist. This by itself will make you immune to a majority of the enemies that have insta-kill and ultimate. Combine this with basically any shield that gives EDK and you'll be immune to like 90% of the enemies. I'm not going to say that you won't get insta-killed because tower exists. But there are a lot of times where most CDK is 72 or lower, so you're already immune to the weaker ends of the EDK scale by just wearing this armor. So I find this pretty useful if I'm looking to do hunts in, let's say, potentially something like jungle, maybe. Uh, caves, definitely. Or if I'm just looking to survive in something like ruins and I'm tired of getting hit by sorcerers, I'll sometimes wear this just to survive their attacks if playing solo. I just wanted to give a special mention to that item. Up next, we have kind of the alternative for multiple characters. Very high defense. Highest DDK a female can get at 25. Universal across all classes. Decent light resist. This can put you almost with the shield above the very minimum EDK needed to survive something like an Old Gibbon or Dark Falls is Megid, since they're below 40 in both cases. So you don't have to go super out of your way just to get that resistance. And honestly, even just having about 30 to 40 resistance is probably okay enough in some runs that involve those kinds of creatures. But be aware most people will want to stack some additional support items later to deal with the remaining EDK. Uh, finally, we have the most expensive of the options, which is the Sweetheart. This is really strong. I only got to play with it a little bit. I kind of regret what I did with this item, and I probably should make another one at some point. But essentially, if you are a female character and you are in a basically all-male party, which honestly with the meta of Affinia, most people are Rawcast, Ucast, Ramar, Humar, Faux Newman. Like, those are, those are pretty common classes in most parties. Uh, as long as you're close to them, you get up to 15 to 25% ATP. Humar Sasa's skill, welcome kill. So be aware that this is just a massive attack bonus. However, unlike the other options, this one is really expensive. So think really, really, really hard if you're going to dedicate yourself to the cause. It is really, really good, but it has conditions. So being able to group closely might not work with all quests. It is very useful in uh, boss rush quests where most players will be grouped together, like Olga Flow or even potentially Gal Griffin, worm bosses, to some extent Dragon Boss, Dark Falls, some phases of Dark Falls, I should specify, where clumping together just results in massive damage. Vault Op is probably the big one where being able to kill it faster is kind of nice. But situationally, it could be used in other areas. Trade-off, it is going to be very, very expensive because it requires an item known as the Magic Rock Heart Key, which by default is going to be, I believe, 50 PDs. Make sure I'm not making things up. Yeah, it's 50 PDs. So just be aware that it is very expensive to do normally, and it has components. Consider revisiting this towards the end of the game. Just put that in there as a cliff note. That's why I always say pick one, revisit later on all these sections, because some of these are really, really good, but uh, yeah, you have alternatives at higher levels. So we'll talk about any end game only, which requires even higher level requirements than the ones we mentioned after this. 
But for now, let's proceed by scrolling down the list a little bit further. So here we have my favorite wall of items. I called them the ATP boosters. They do essentially the same thing. Almost every item adds 35 ATP and it does this or or it does that. Like they're, they're, they're basically interchangeable. I put them in order of, I would say, preference, if I had to say, maybe for defense. Arguably, you might want to put Yadimir higher, whatever. At least I mentioned it in the video, because I'm letting you know, I was going back and forth which one is more useful. Kasami Bracer has really high defense, super good evasion, and really solid elemental resist, and there is a lot of elemental damage coming from bosses, so this is just a really great boss pickup item to survive annoying attacks like falls, for example. Next up we have Yanamir, which again is going to be very similar. Higher level requirement, lower defense, lower evasion. However, it gets light resistance, which might be more useful in very niche scenarios. However, what makes this a little different, and I'm going to hide the URL briefly, if we scroll down a little further, it has a bonus to the Foe tech. So I like Kasami Bracer more in that scenario for casts, but for characters like the Humar or the Hucus or the Hunural, excuse me, that have the ability to cast Foe into falls. This is pretty crucial in dealing with the enemy in kind of a timely manner. But just be aware that it is useful to do, I would say, to have this item over the other one if you're looking to do a lot of uh, Dark Falls runs. If you're looking more for a generic shield, I actually kind of like the Sami Bracer a little more, so that's where I ended up settling in my list. We have a more universal option, but I would say is probably the least preferred. So if you get this at a good price, combat gear, it gives you 35 ATP. That's it. Th that's all it does. There's a low level requirement. It's a little cut off on the screen, but it's level 66. It's universal, which has its benefits, but again, I, I would recommend for Hunter specifically, just be aware that I, I like the other two options more. I guess if you really don't want to unequip at any point, combat gear's lower level requirement is kind of nice for ultimate. Otherwise, it just kind of gets outshined. Uh, finally, if we're just looking for a super early game barrier... So for just a little bit for a moment. Uh, this one is lower ATP, but decent resistances. But again, I would say you're more, it's more of a convenience thing, what you would like to do. I would recommend the other ATP boosters. But Hunter Wall is one you can also get without trading much. I just want you to be aware that it's kind of up to you, how you wh whichever you prefer in that particular list. Let's talk about our next item, which is the Anti-Dark Ring. I think this one is really, really strong as an alternative to the Dress Plate. It doesn't give 70 EDK, it gives 60. However, it is universal, so it doesn't care if you're male or female. The downside is the normal requirement to get this item is playing a quest called Terrell's Ego on Affinia which is kind of hard to do by yourself. So I've seen most people kind of trade for this item. However, if you combine this potentially with Dressplate, you're basically immune to every EDK attack in the game, minus the Mary Corals or whatever they're called because they just kill you instantly and they suck. But I think for the most part, this item's kind of a neat thing to put in your back pocket. So if you have a really strong armor or you're looking to use 13, but you need EDK, this would be an alternative, for example. Yeah, murder flowers. Yeah, there's something good. Uh, finally, we just have items that I'm going to put under the generically good. They can be used to keep safe in uh, certain runs and or they'll carry you out of the lower difficulties. So again, your the use you will get out of this will depend on your comfort level with the game. Are you kind of decent, to be honest? Mm. Do, do you mean the one that requires four shield components? I don't know. I consider that more endgame. At least you can become immune, that is true. So this is just a really easy pickup as you go through. So this one you don't necessarily need to trade for. However, it is used in components uh, to create something called From the Depths. So I figured I might as well put this in here, even though generally I would say to just farm this over trading it. If you're looking to make a lot of the clears deal 5 items though, potentially just be aware of this combination. I think a slightly better version of this shield, if you're looking for just general defense as you play the game, is uh, Attribute Wall. 
For example, this one has about 30 to fire resist. This one also gives you, I think, comparatively 10 more ice resist and 5 to the other resists. So, attribute wall is just straight up an upgrade, but it might be more expensive since it is a little more annoying to farm. So just be aware that these are just different options. And finally, if you truly just never want to die... Oops, all this correctly. There is a ridiculously tanky uh, shield known as Gracia. So if you combine this EDK of 24 plus dress plate, you have a 94 dark resistance, which means that you're basically immune to everything. Decently high defense on a shield, super good evasion. Overall, just really solid anti-boss shield if you're looking to survive hits from things like falls, for example or potentially just looking to deal with a lot of annoying elemental attacks from something like your Gerdabulu. So just be aware that this option is cast only. It can be shared between hunters and rangers. I will situationally use this, but generally speaking, I prefer the ATP barriers, which is why I put them a little higher on the list. But when you're starting out, the ability to survive cannot be underrated, chat. Like, I'm just going to be honest with you, some people just need the ability to just not get one shot. Materia is an, aw is an uh, awful 20 elemental at 51, but also 3 seals exist. Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about some of the alternate shields. Like, they're mentioning a couple here. Oops, of course. Siryu. It's not bad, but it's like, I don't know if I'm really gonna go out of my way for it. Yeah, Koryu, we'll talk about a little later, has really good resistances, but more importantly is PB create. But it is generally kind of expensive, so we'll we'll touch base on that in a moment. But I just figured I'd pop those up just so that people watching along on the VOD slash YouTube have some context of what's being mentioned. Uh, I would say the last one where arguably it falls technically before the end game items is. Let's see if I could get this item to pop up. Nope. I'll find it eventually, chat. I promise. There we go. I found it. So, there is a really fantastic item for casts. Really low level requirement. Downside, really annoying to get. So people will charge way more for this than any of the other shields we have. It's not as bad as Sweetheart, though. You will not be spending like 100-something PDs on it. But you'll probably be spending anywhere between 15 to 25 from personal experience to get one of these. The reason I really like this on, in particular, Hue Cast is that... Uh, Hugh only problem as a hunter is his accuracy. So having a very low level requirement shield that gives him that accuracy is just kind of busted. <laughs> like, honestly, Tat, this has been like a game-changing rare for me. So I will put this on the list. I don't know if I recommend it necessarily over ATP for majority of the characters, but I want to give a special shout out to Hugh and how much of a difference this makes for him. It's not bad on Hugh Castile. I would say I only really benefited from gameplay with this, from anecdotal experience, uh, trying to land Hell or Arrest as like a support role. Otherwise, if I'm just looking to consistently use charge attacks, which I normally do like normal heavy special kind of things, or normal power special, whatever you want to call it, um, I don't think it was like needed on Hugh Seal. If I'm looking to do like normal Hell Hell, for example, then yes, I would probably wear S parts in those kinds of scenarios. The very useful for support role, honestly, I like this a little more than ATP on something like a Hugh cast because he gets so much ATP and arguably Hugh Casile has really high accuracy but still benefits from it. Just think about it, make a judgment call. The 15 accuracy is more important in harder areas, the beginning areas. So if I'm doing something like as I said before, a lot of episode one, maybe uh, forests, caves, maybe as far as mines, I'd rather have ATP. So we're talking about episode two, or even to some extent episode four, uh, I will prefer the accuracy. So it really depends on which area I'm in as to what I want to swap into. So that's why potentially later on, you might want to consider having multiple shields to cover those kinds of scenarios. Like if you're going to do a lot of lily hunts because your purple ID and that's what you want to do, just be aware you need those kinds of shields and armors to go towards the run so you don't have a absolutely miserable time. Let's move on a little bit. So fortunately this guide is not as long as the other ones, so deep breath chat. 
We're we're about a, we're almost a third of the way through. So we have boss optimization. So the way I kind of view it is um, really minor optimization. If you can get an MN60 Vice. Mech gun. It's just basically a small upgrade over the Balkans. You'll end up getting these potentially as part of a an event drop. So I wanted to give special attention to this. Not necessarily something you trade for, unless people unless it's around holiday time, then it does tend to get a little cheaper. So keep an eye out for it. It's just like very slightly better mech gun. If you don't have a berserk mech gun from earlier, so let's say you did a charge mech gun. It might make more sense to get a vice over getting another Berserk Vulcan from up here. So just be aware of that particular option. I'm going to draw special attention again to Disco Brave Man in 13. Then I would say for the most part, you basically just need to find like your Worm Killer. So there's a couple options that you can do, and we mentioned one earlier. So now that you're like looking to specifically deal with bosses... There we go. Sometimes it gets stuck. Uh, Jaya is a really strong weapon that does 5.56 times multiplier whenever you use the special. However, every swing does about 10,000. Let me hide this so I can see this. So just be aware that even though this is a common item, getting this with at least 30 hit is a bit more annoying to get. So if for whatever reason you're ready to do TTF or you're ready to do... Uh, respective tomorrow and you really need something to kill the worm bosses and you don't already have something like an Excalibur this is a really solid option in particular for characters like you cast with a little bit of hit percentage that will basically just decimate the bosses and honestly a lot of high level play will involve you just burning tens of thousands of Meseta so even though I say this for worm boss be aware that for Jaya specifically Really, really, really high level play will basically have this maxed out in percentage with as high hit as possible in order to use it in basically almost every single wave and or room that they're able to use it in. So if you're fighting Morans or Sinnohs, you will see high level players just whip this out and basically two shot enemies because it is just so overwhelmingly powerful on hunters in particular that it just absolutely devastates. However, the reason I say this is not part of the starter kit, most people cannot just throw out 10,000 a swing, every single swing, for an entire quest, multiple quests in a row. So while this is a really great endgame item that ironically you could get as early as hard mode, it is just too expensive for normal gameplay until you are truly, truly at the end of the game. So just be aware that this exists. It's ridiculous. I love it, but it's very expensive. I think you could get 40 hit Jaya quests from government quests. Well, let's scroll down because it should be in the wiki. Ooh. Oh, you gotta clear up the spaceship on ultimate as hunter. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know about that chat. Okay, for those that haven't seen this, story mode in episode two is terrible. It is really bad. If that was episode one, I would have been like, yeah, go pick that up for free. The episode two story mode? Hmm. We'll have a separate video maybe on that. Maybe chat will finally help me clear this. Because I failed story mode as like a 160 cast, by the way. In Temple. Like, thanks, game. <laughs> Stupid time limit quest with your confusing mazes. Well, anyway, I guess if you're willing to put up with the nonsense that is episode two uh, story mode quests. Yeah, it's not too bad. 40 hit is like 2 to 8, exactly. I would say the minimum is 30, but arguably, if you're willing to bump it up, I would say... Like, Q Seal really honestly only needs it to be 30. Maybe I'll say 40 plus. Uh, I'm gonna say 40 plus for non Q Seal. Honestly, she really needs, like, almost nothing to hit. Like, she doesn't hit any important thresholds, I don't think. Between 30 and 40. Hopefully he says, yeah, if you don't have a group or house stuff, <laughs> every unre- Yeah, very unreasonable solo, exactly. Maybe, maybe we'll have a special stream to cover that. That's another topic. <laughs> There's a couple of things I want to do on stream, so we'll just make a note here. Yeah, even zero hit is pretty good. It's just- it's so ridiculous. 
Yeah, I think it's also important to note that uh, I think uh, Kiel pointed out something important that I think I missed in our other video. It does use heavy attack accuracy and it pushes back like a heavy attack. That's actually pretty important for uh, things like ruins. Uh, if you're looking to knock back like bulk claws or something like that, it's actually important to know that that knocks back because that can mess up your combos because some special attacks don't do that. So just be aware that it can knock back and it can be very safe. But also it costs you money regardless if you hit. But also it doesn't charge per enemy. But also, yeah, it's just broken. Just get the, just get this weapon eventually, please. It's so good. It's so good, Chad. Anyway, let's go back to the list. Hopefully you're doing well, Hellcleave. So we touched upon it very briefly, but there are some bosses that require a little bit of specialization. And honestly, Chad, if you have any input for what a hunter is meant to do in episode four, I was thinking about this for like three weeks and I was like, I honestly don't know what they do. Like outside of Diska of Brave Man, I honestly, they almost never break it in multiplayer because of the fact that they can't evenly damage it. But if Chad has any suggestions, you have like two minutes to think about it. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll just be in the document later. So let's start with Volt Op. We'll, we'll get back to that conundrum for episode four later. Hellcleave is saying normal hunter stuff and also run some hell stuff and be fine. Exactly. So basically your options to deal with, um, I would say annoying enemies would be the combination of Sacred Duster, Excalibur, or Galatine. We mentioned V801 earlier, but let's actually formally discuss it in general. Supposedly, Rainbow Baton is good if you do the cave solo on Hunter. Just charge Volk the spinners, just get them and wait for someone else to do cave, then see Volk again. Yeah, see, that's that's what I was thinking, because I'm like, they don't normally do anything, exactly. Which I think is fair. I'll make a note that charge Vulcan on the spinners. I didn't include that there. But anyway, this unit's only usable by people with techniques, so that's 5 MST. More importantly, it just decreases cast speed. If you combine it with things with such as the Sacred Duster, which we didn't talk about in any of uh, you can take advantage of the male uh, fist animation while casting spells to cast spells more quickly. So this is just kind of an alt version of Excalibur slash Galatine. If you didn't pick one up earlier, this is very specific that it could be used across the hunters, potentially, like the Humar, the Unural. But technically, like, the Huneral doesn't benefit from it as much because she doesn't have a different cast animation. But Excalibur Galatine's pretty good. Or if he says, I guess you could use an Astrine Cutter to minimize damage variance in Episode 4 boss, maybe? That is probably a good point. Unfortunately, crits exist. Yeah, I think the difference is, like, I think I agree with Keel. They mostly have issues hitting the target, especially when, the, when they reel back. Oh, I'm actually going to put Rainbow Baton there. But I'll put S ranks as a backup later on. Uh, we'll put this in quotes for now. So we'll briefly talk about Rainbow Baton. We mentioned this before in the other guides. I think I agree with Rainbow Baton. I was thinking really hard how they can deal with the enemy, the boss reeling backwards. I think Spuzz or Thunder had a video on it. Interesting. The reason why I like this is specifically because of this little bonus. So normally what'll happen is the boss will reel backwards in episode four. Sorry, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but it's, it's in the chat. We have to address what's being spoken about. So this extra distance will cover when the boss goes backwards. And I think this is more important than just dealing damage with 13. So I think I will agree, especially Rainbow Baton with hit. The downside is you normally need to craft it with... Um, uh, the Artista Stone plus another Slicer, but if you're looking to trade, you don't have to worry about that. Just look for at least 50 hit and you should be fine. I wouldn't say much, but... Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna say alternatively. I'll just mention it here, because you, you do need to hit it. Uh, single target damage. 
ranged. Single target. Yes, I'll just put it for the Vulcan. So we'll just improve the guide a little bit. That's all we'll talk about. <laughs> Again, if we get sidetracked, it's fine. It's just ultimately making the guide a little stronger. So we covered uh, Vieta 1. We went very extensively in this and another guide, so I'm just going to try to summarize it. The boss rotating around in the monitors, Vol Op in mines, only really cares about your ATP, and it has iframes, so you can only hit it so often. So what people will do is they'll equip a very high ATP weapon and constantly spam Gazond. So that way, even though it does no damage to the monitors because it's a tech, uh, you're basically dealing your ATP as fast as you could cast it. So V801 allows for stun locks. If you're playing solo, you have an option for casts known as the Red Handgun, which the only thing that really matters on this is machine percentage. So if you get this with a decent machine percentage, you're basically getting, let's see, every every 10% is about 30 ATP added, about-ish, before considering grinders and stuff like that. So it's pretty strong in terms of how many extra levels you're getting per machine percent. So, pretty, pretty, pretty good to do to basically cheat kill the boss sooner. Um, alternatively, there's one you can trade an item ticket for. So you can either get an item ticket directly or see if it's in the trade directly. Known as the Drill Launcher. This weapon's a bit more awkward. I honestly didn't end up liking this option that much over the Red Handgun. Especially Red Handgun with a uh, higher machine percentage. But basically, it is a allegedly a rifle type weapon. What this doesn't say, which I find kind of confusing, is that the shot actually splits. So like the special is pierce, but the normal attack is kind of like a close range shotgun. And I don't really see that mentioned anywhere, by the way. Like it says target one, but that's not true. That's definitely not true. It definitely splits the shot. You can even look at the graphic when you attack this. So I'm gonna wave my finger on the wiki on this one. But basically, if you stand a certain distance from the monitor, you can hit all four monitors with one shot, because the shot will split, like a shotgun will, and you can basically stun lock the boss that way. The downside to this is it requires kind of a rhythmic timing, and it requires you to unequip your things like Heavenly Battle. If you're wearing something like a Blue Doshi Nimadal, it's not even really possible as a Hukas or Hukasil to do this strategy. I just found Red Handgun a lot easier, to be honest with you. And it's more universal across other characters, etc. Um, otherwise, we mentioned Twin Blaze before. So being able to use Gafoe on monitors while somebody else focuses on Stunlock means that every fireball that you throw applies your ATP, and you barely damage the monitors at all. That's a pretty solid multiplayer option. We've had a couple of runs where there were two people using Twin Blaze at once to help with lockdown, with the rare occasional Gazan being thrown in. With the intent being that Hugh cast ATP is so insane and busted with a decently machine percented twin blaze that is basically just GG for the enemy. <clears throat> so just be aware that those options exist. I would say from the standpoint of alternate clears, we have a couple other items. Let me just copy that into this item real quick. So let's move on to falls. So this is kind of like the end-all be-all. Like this is the dream item to get with hit percentage, but this can end up being a little bit expensive. So the intent behind this is that it fires five shots in a row. It is really, 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 really good on Hucast, as it also provides you with a pistol range weapon. So basically it's like shooting two shots from a mech gun, but sadly you have to get really good hit percentage to land this consistently. It's not as bad in single player to land, but multiplayer, if you're not rolling with like 40 plus hit, I just don't know how accurately you're going to land it without also having a lot of other boosts. So I would recommend checking out the calculator, which we talked about, I think, in the other guides. I might put a link at the top of this guide later on for it and mention it again. But yeah, there are calculators to determine your class specific thresholds as to what hit percentage it's useful to have and where like there might not be a big difference for you between like 60 hit and 70 hit for example but there's a big difference between having 50 hit and 20 hit because being able to land just a power attack by itself is pretty huge so if you can only hit it with a normal attack it's generally not worth using 
Um, so sometimes what pe people will do instead. Hunter accuracy with L1K38 is painful and heavy tax, exactly. So, like, technically, Rangers and Forces can use it, but I mostly see it on a high hit percentage on Hugh Cast. Just because being able to do five shots with all this ATP is huge. It also has the side bonus of having a special here, but without really high hit percentage, you're basically never landing it. It's better than doing nothing, but there are better specials to use on the boss when, when it's invulnerable. So, Master Raven is kind of a nice weapon. It can be used outside of falls as you get higher in level. Uh, it's just kind of a useful, basically, triple tap without locking you into place. So it's a ranger that shoots like a three mech gun stream. Has actually decently high accuracy for a pistol. 52 is pretty good. And otherwise its special is a little bit disappointing. However, as you get higher in ATP, sometimes you just want to single tap creatures. So being able to shoot those three shots without being locked into place will end up being kind of a time saver. So as you get higher and higher level, you'll end up using this in more and more scenarios just because of the fact that your ATP is so high. So be aware that this eventually converts from a boss-only spinner kill option for Hugh Mars and Hugh Cass into, sure, I could just double tap something in caves real quick. <laughs> like, just be aware. Like, they get better as you level, since these are very ATP dependent. So we already mentioned Holy Ray, so I'm not going to go back into that. We talked about Vulcan. We very briefly mentioned Rainbow Baton. I will go back to Rainbow Baton one more time, because it is useful as, like, a general crowd control item, I guess. So I think what I'll end up doing is I'll end up putting it back in the situational list at the top, because it can cause Confuse, which, while not super useful in multiplayer, in single player, the more you have the enemies not focusing you, the better. So until you get to the point where you're basically combo killing everything, Confusing entire waves of people is really funny. I'm not gonna lie, chat. Like, your, your sad, like, 900 ATP hunter is going to do nothing to, like, the Sinnohs compared to a confused Sinnoh punching their friends. Like, it's, it's just a fact. Eventually, that will not be true, and it's less useful as you climb in power. But early on, when you're just entering ultimate, and in particular, if you're not at pure max materials, and you might even be below 800 ATP, depending on the character with that combination. It, it, it is useful for clears. Murphy says it's great for multiplayer, lets you grieve the dark floating in the cast. Oh, <laughs> probably best not to troll people with freeze traps. Murphy given uh, bad ideas to other players. No, I'm willing to put this, I think, a little higher up as well. Put this under optional support. Honestly, I feel. Well, let me. Yeah, let me just. Let me put this at the end because I don't want to emphasize that this is more important than the other items. I definitely think like an S Red Blade or a Demon Ray Gun or a Twin Blaze are more important to get. I oh, just want to put a little emphasis there. So otherwise, like your end game stuff is eventually at some point you need to get a caliber for Dark Flow. So sadly, this is one of those items where, like, you just kind of need it at some point, unless you're, like, Hughcast, because Hughcast doesn't care about things. But if Hughcast gets it, all the better. So it's a it's a massive sword that has decent attack power. More importantly, let's hide this. It shoots five attacks at high at heavy attack accuracy with infinite vertical range. Requirement, though, is that you need to be at 12.5% of your health or lower. So people will end up using a lot of Berserk items, whether it's Disco Brave Man or uh, MN60 Vices, which is a Berserk equivalency of the uh, Berserk Vulcans. Uh, there is a lot of items that you could drain your health with, and as soon as you get this item, this is kind of like a run-defining item, because a lot of the time, if you're by yourself, you might not be able to kill, let's say, the Dragon Boss before it takes flight, until you're higher level, especially if you're playing single player. So having an option to deal with those is just kind of ridiculous. 
Neil says, I still use my Restless Lion Dark Flow. See, we could, I know those acronyms this time. The lock vault off since I don't have a high machine weapon yet. I mean, it's it's also pretty good at just beating down Vault Op, honestly, Phase 2. I don't know if I would really want to use it. Oh, you mean you're holding this as you cast with uh, Q-Bar and q -Neural. Oh, never mind. That makes more sense. I was thinking you... I almost thought you meant the projectile. I was like, man, that those monitors never stood a chance. I was like, wait a minute. That just seems mean and unnecessary. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's super, super strong. So just be aware that this is like... The item that will let you do runs, it'll let you do bosses. I list that under bosses, but honestly, having a higher hit version, which I mentioned later on uh, for the endgame section, this is kind of like the run-defining item, as I said before. So most people, if they're playing Hunter, will expect to be at 12.5% or less health, which makes their life a little bit riskier. Oh, poor Dango. We'll help Dango get it eventually. So be aware that you then have to pick, if you have a Dark Flow, you need to pick at least one of these options. So all of these have specials that basically drain your health. Some of these are Ubers. I don't even think it's really worth going into a lot of detail. Just be aware that there are a lot of ways to drain your health, but these are probably the most common. I'm gonna say... I'll explicitly call out Discovery Man. Technically. Yeah, I like Gearsol the most of this option. Probably most useful out of combat, honestly. I think that's fair to put there. There, There's so many options. I, I could be listing these forever. I, slash Raygun. <laughs> Hopefully Chad is happy. There's so many options. But yeah, you need at least something. Oh, wait, hold on. I might have put that in the wrong category. Let me double check. I think that drains PB, right? Oh, no, that drains health. Okay, I didn't mistake it for the other thing. Yeah, so having something that drains without a target... Maybe I should... Let me recategorize this. We'll say... Targeted. Non-targeted. How's that, chat? That make a little more sense. Because we just have so many options. There we go. I think that makes a little more sense. Yeah, the, the, it's kind of one of those things where there's reasons to use it. I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I personally just prefer Gear Soul. I have Lava Blade slash Double Cannon. It's okay. Oh, Cleve says, oh, yeah, I meant to ask. I've seen a 16 move caliber. I know you're looking for a second caliber. Uh, maybe. I'll, I'll think about it, hopefully. I might save off for a 65 hit, to be honest. Well, I don't know. I'll take your opinion, Hell Cleve. Do you think a 60 hit caliber would be useful on any of the hunters that I have? We'll, we'll have real time trade advice. Because right now I just have one for- I have a 50 hit, or no, I have a 60 hit on my Huka seal currently. The, the sad- if that had dark percentage, I would be more willing to grab it. Because I do use it the most on falls, although Vault Off Phase 2 is fun. Yeah. Like, he might be able to get away with it. I'll, I'll say sure, Hell I guess I'll pick it up. So anyway, let's talk about... I would just do Restless Lion, 70 hit, and Sphere. Yeah, I already have... I have better than Restless Lion already. So we're good. Like, I have, like, a double 40, 60 hitter. Which is totally fine. Yeah, getting the other percentage is hard, exactly. So anyway, let's let's continue onwards. So let's talk about high level optimization. These are things you can kind of hold off on and revisit. So I'm putting this under the situational hunter item category. So max stat mag when you're within 190. You literally don't need this for a majority of your gameplay through ultimate. It's just there to squeeze out a few more stats. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking only maybe the hue cast because the hue castle doesn't need it. I don't know if my hue neural would benefit from it. 
And that's kind of an important point when talking about these things. So most people will be fine with doing Restless Lion for 50 hit or two other attributes, which is why I recommend it here. But there are scenarios where you're just looking to land a hit in multiplayer, and sometimes it is more important that you have the hit percentage than the attributes. Not to say that attribute is weak or anything, it's just that sometimes you just can't land it. <laughs> just You just can't. It's really awkward. Like, I still whip on Huka Seal on, like, Falls. Yeah, exactly. There's a big price difference between the two. But anyway, um... Do, 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 do. So we'll talk about some optimizations here. The max stat mag is kind of nice. Yeah, Hellcleave giving you examples of the real-time trading. Hellcleave is the, probably the most, most efficient at that compared to me when it comes to those things. Trading is not necessarily my forte, but I know most items at least. So let's talk about Adept. I actually really like Adept on Hunural a lot, especially if I'm looking to unseal with items. However, if you're not looking to unseal with Hunural, it's definitely a very niche item to pick up. I was talking with uh, Tiggy before, but if you happen to have this, it gives 5 less accuracy than Heavenly Arms, but more importantly, 6 to all resistances and 10 luck is actually really, really strong on most characters. So if you happen to replace, for example, two Heavenly Arms with two uh, Adepts later on, getting 12 to all resistances is kind of big on some runs, to the point where like you won't get knocked down by uh, AoE attacks that are elemental, you'll have maxed out luck without Red Ring. I leave this on Hue World permanently. Having a Kafoe merch for Hue World is a good idea. Can she wear those? Let's learn. Oh, that's true. For some reason, I thought she couldn't. Let me put that in there, then. I have that in the force section later on. We'll put this under... Unsealing. So we'll say... Do uh, Kofoe merge, which gives a 30% bonus. Or reuse, uh, not a mirror. Well, actually, it doesn't matter for that. Let's not do that. Confoy Emerge is fine by itself. Cascom emerges too. Yeah, it's one of those ones where I, I just haven't looked up the item in a while. So that that's on me, for sure, for not double-checking. Doing normal is fine without it, but lets you do a little hard a little easier. Yeah, exactly. So I, I ended up putting a couple of unsealing items that I didn't talk about, I think, in the other guides there. I might retroactively add them into the other guides, uh, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. That's a good point. I'll say conserving TP when unsealing. I, I do like the add-up unit by itself. It's just, it's kind of a, we'll call it more of a luxury rare. Like, it is way more expensive to get add-ups than it is Heavenly Arms, which is why I don't usually recommend it in the starter kits for any characters. I would say for forces, it's definitely more of a priority item, but Funeral Roll is very useful to keep that on, to be honest, because she's one of the only characters that could really quickly unseal things like the Swordsman more which is the usually why you would use her, plus she can also wield an Excalibur, have the Swordsman lore, and unlock other limiters, technically. So if you really kit her out, she could be useful. So just be aware that those things help with the clear. Um, and then kind of as you start hitting like really high level, like let's say also around 190 plus, you eventually don't need any max uh, accuracy units. So if you're just looking for something to fill a slot to give yourself a little bit of accuracy, I would go in order of Centurion Ability, Heavenly Ability, or if you are not fall, if you're looking to swap over materials and you're looking to do your class max materials, it might be useful to have a Heavenly Power to cap. I guess I should explicitly put in here. Uh, I'm gonna say min max. Aerial plan. I'll put those together. But anyway, 
those are just kind of nice units to have. Again, very situational. You don't have to pick it up if you don't want to. I love using these on my uh, rangers and stuff like that. I also use it on my hunters. Sometimes I really just want to make sure I have my luck bonus capped before red ring. So just having one of these here to, because I only need maybe, let's say, 25 or less accuracy, being able to Centurion ability plus also have just one Heavenly Arms and or an Adept will mean that I'm more slot efficient since I'm getting more out of those slots than just keeping it as Heavenly Arms. But again, very situational, not something I would rush over anything else, so that's why I put this in a completely separate category. Uh, females can get a 40 hit plus Tyrell's Parasol, which does charge damage, which I don't think we went over in detail, actually. I think I mentioned it before, but we didn't open it in the corner. Let's formally look at this. So, it's a charge partisan that's only usable by females, and it's not too bad in there. Oh, you know what? You're right. I think I forgot to save this before I started the stream. You're 100% you're right. I looked at this, and I was like, I am missing Cleo. So, both of these items allow for different buffs. So, for example, let me hide this one. So, for example, Tyrell's Parasol gives you a boosted range of heal, shift, and deban, which is pretty useful. Cleo is usable on Hugh Neural in Affinia. It's not usable in non-Affinia servers for them. It's really strong. Yeah, it's it's a little sad. Humar can't use it in Ramar, can't use it. MSC requirement brutal. Poor Ramar in particular. But having the ability to Zalord at distance is pretty huge. Let me scroll down so you can see this. So that's the main appeal of Cleo. You don't use it for anything other than the Zalor range. And just in case this was hidden before, scroll down slightly. Shift to D-Ban range on Terrell's Parasol. So Terrell's Parasol having the extra hit is good. You more trade to trust for Spirit Special, he's not an economist. Maybe. So I just wanted to draw attention to those two items. And Ryuker can't forget Ryuker, it's true. Listen, he needs to save slots on telepipes. Anyway, let's go back to the window. So then we have probably the more interesting item here. I don't see many people using this. Maybe I'll whip this out and bother attacking with this again. This is kind of a weird... I don't know how to describe it for people that haven't used it before. I like to think of this as, like, the insta-delete. <laughs> So, four casts and Hunter only, which I am playing a bit more, so maybe I'll whip this item out again. Although, I don't know if I have an accuracy one for this. <laughs> Essentially, you could drain your PB, which is useful in scenarios where you're looking to trigger Mag Blast over and over. So by itself, it's already nice to lower it, step one. Step two, if you have really strong percents on the, on the Beardish, basically what you could do is just use the special attack three times. Let me also hide this. You can use the special attack three times and basically treat it as like your own Gafoe. So, Hugh Cast and Hugh Casile can kind of instant spawn kill things. It is useful in some runs, but not a ton. And obviously, needing to burn PB is just kind of there. It's like a budget TGS. Uh. Kind of. It's more meant to stack versus using mid combo. TGS, I thought you just used as like a beat stick with its special. This one, you can preempt it and they just kind of get deleted because it lingers. So you just do this between waves and then swap into your real weapon and then watch enemies get deleted on the way down. So you could kill Sinnohs with this, for example. They'll technically could kill things like Rappies with it. Yeah, I've only seen this used a couple of times. It's like, uh... It, it's one of those ones where it's just very situational. So. I will, I will draw a note to this. It has its use. Experiment with it. I think this weapon is slept on. I think maybe on stream, I'll try to whip one of these out again. It has kind of awkward hunts, like Viridian Pan Arms Episode 2. It, it's it's very awkward. I'll put it this way. It's like, you, you don't normally hunt the things that are here. I think I ended up getting it on Green ID Fighting a Miracle, I think was my first one as an example. Like, it's, it's not a common hunt either, so I think that combination of things makes it a, a lot less popular. But anyway, let's go back to the list. So I'm not going to go through these individual items. 
Your cures, everything other than cure poison has a use. Consider picking up these quality of life items. They make certain runs really easy. Healthy says, assuming you're not using PB in a run, CTF mainly would consider it for Dark Ranger room. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, you know, there are enemies that you could just damage on spawn and they can walk into them. So you can set them up for it. It's kind of nice. Kind of nice. We added an additional thing for Gafoe Merge, which will pop up again for the benefit of the chat in the corner. But basically, this is where we're going to talk about this a lot, a lot uh, when it comes to the forces. But it's a level 12 barrier that buffs uh, Gafoe by 30%, showing it again briefly. Otherwise, we just have... Oh, I put it down here under quality of life. Uh, That's fine, then, as long as it's somewhere. Okay, so I did add it in my defense. I just forgot I moved it in the category. So Cleo's still there. So... From that standpoint, I would say make sure you have something to learn text. So if you're looking to teach your level 80 character uh, level 20 shift to D-band, you will probably need some combination of Mind Mag and Heavenly Mind uh, units, which grant, I believe, 45 MST. Uh, hunters don't need this as much, but it might be useful if you're situationally looking to survive something like Epsilon. Heavenly HP grants 100 HP, God HP grants 80 HP. Generally, Hunters don't need this as much, but it also just really depends how hard you're rushing the endgame content. So I'm going to put that as a big question mark. But generally speaking, I don't recommend it as much over some of the other ones. The funeral is Cleo. We talked about the stats don't really matter. Just use it for the Zalora buff boost. We mentioned earlier that there's things you can stack with Dress Plate or potentially the Anti-Dark Ring in order to get 100, 100 EDK. So Resist Devil adds 15 EDK, Divine Protection adds 20, but it only works on certain beats of the clock, which is kind of annoying. Divine Protection is technically better when it's active. If you're using this purely for anti-EDK purposes, you can check the clock, maybe it'll benefit you. To be honest with you, I don't like dealing with this item. Maybe they'll hashtag free divine protection. <laughs> Maybe. It's already not very commonly used due to that time restriction. Otherwise, it is technically just a straight upgrade over Resist Devil. I guess I'll put that item in the corner for chat. So yeah, it boosts uh, EDK and light resistance by 20, as well as doubling your luck. However, it only works at odd beats, so... It is unfortunate. It potentially has the the opportunity of just having two of these with like an anti-dark gives 100 resist and also makes you basically immune to falls which is funny so both of those potentially could be useful but whatever figured i'd mention it finally i would say probably the least useful of the support items there are a couple things known as the merges one of which is for shifta this basically just doubles the range of shifta I don't tend to use it, so I'm going to undersell it. I don't even mention it most of the time. Technically, the better statted version of the Shift Emerge is the Rupika, but it has the level 101 requirement. It's just, it also gets 25 Dark Resists, too, so it's like sometimes useful in other runs if you're looking to play more support role and looking to survive caves. It's not bad for that, actually, but again, I I'm not going to recommend these over the, the other options. And then finally, we have two units known as PB Create and PB Instance. Now, PB Create is just a weaker version of, or PB Increase. So, for example, both of them are usable by all classes. PB Create's one photon blast point every 23 seconds. Increase is once every 18. The difference is Increase requires uh, items from Claire's Deal 5, which we did talk about briefly in the beginning of the guide. Um, and the way I see this as being useful is that if you're playing very casually and you know you are a person that likes to go AFK, especially in solo play, and you need to do something for three minutes, you might as well just throw this on and get PB. I think people sleep on how useful this is to have in certain runs. I think, for example, if you're using a lot of Hell or Charge items, but you're still looking to potentially donate, in larger chains for things like maybe not so much RT, but kind of like off meta quests like Endless. The sooner you're able to get the Photon Blast gauge, the better. 
The way I view it is hunters are pretty good at building it by themselves, so they have a lot of ATP. However, if you find yourself leaning a lot more towards specials over doing actual damaging hits, you will be surprised how useful this is in some quests. Basically, if the quest is at least, let's say, 12 minutes long, if it goes over 12 minutes, it's probably helpful to have. That's my general rule of thumb. There's a lot of quests that fall under that. Some of them are meta, some of them are not. Some of them will fall under RBR for the quest. But as I said before, the sooner you're able to get this, the better. So for example, endless resets every 20 floors, but you want to ideally have Photon Blast within 11 floors. So if you don't have that and you've already spent about 6 minutes in there, it kind of just helps you do it right before a boss. And as I said before, if you're ever AFK for any reason, this is just a great unit just to have on hand in order to cap out. PB increase is technically a little better. Uh, when I play more, I would say, Rangers and Forces, and I'll make sure to bring it up for them as well, I tend to have a lot of those because they don't need as many units as like the Hunter does necessarily, in particular the Fomoral. So just be aware that these items can be useful in those runs to make a difference between whether you're just donating at all 30 towards a full Photon Blast or pushing you from being at like 80 or 85 in the run up to 100 for it. Or if he says it's useful at higher levels of force, they have a lot of trouble in PvP area. I view this as more mandatory on force. Hunter, it's situational. It really just depends on what weapons you're attacking with. Like, I feel like if you are doing a lot of attacks with Last Swan, or you're doing a lot of like normal heavy attacks, then generally you don't need it as much. But again, I, I do want to draw attention to this. I do feel like people sleep on this option. And there are so many times where we lose I think we were timing out. We were losing like a minute, minute and a half in a run because somebody did not build Photon Blast. I don't know. I never expected Force to do more than donate for PP Chains. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I'm going to tell you what Episode 4 forces. Let's go on a tangent. They can run like triple PP Create. If you're playing Episode 2, you could run triple PP Create. Like, you're, you're going to be using like what? Heavenly? Or you're going to be using a V101? Very rarely you'll be putting on a V502 because it's just a pain in the butt to use. You'll probably just be sticking to demons most of the time as a force rather than try to land those over literally anybody else for the support role. So you just end up having so many free units on your characters. Yeah. Need Smart Link too. Uh, it depends. Episode 4, I would say maybe not, honestly. Unless you're fighting Gurdafulu. Like, if I'm doing episode 4 surface, or like boss, I don't bother with Smart Link most of the time. Like, I, unless I'm specifically like the bringer's arm user as a force, I don't even think Smart Link is- I think Smart Link's kind of overrated, honestly, on force. Unless you have like that really good 50 hit item, and you're doing tower, or maybe you're helling in seabed. But even then, it's just like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, if, if you're at a party with a ranger that has, like, demon, like, demon anything, and you have somebody else with paralysis, you don't really need to be on Gurdabulu duty. Yeah, like, it, I, I would say that's party specific. I, I find for the most part, I tend to play with, like, kind of mid-range hunters and rangers, so they'll, I'll have some people that have S rank, some people that don't, but they might have V501. And that's usually good enough. I don't usually need to step in as a force. Most of the time in things like episode 4, it would be better for me to keep spamming Gafoe unless there's literally nothing else for me to target. <laughs> so it's like, if a room spawns and there's four creatures and like three are Goron Detonators or three are Zoos, it's better for me to lock them down than to arrest the Gurdabulu. So I would rather spam Razond or Rabarda in those same scenarios. Just giving a small tangent there on our little conversation on that. But I do think people sleep on it. Fomoral in particular requires like no units to max stats. So when we were talking about before, like with the god abilities or your centurions or your heavenlies that add like 35, uh, 25, and 20, etc. to your stats, uh, some characters just cap really early because the game hates on them. So it's like you could free up those slots. Like, I don't think PB create and increases is useful in like a huge role. 
I'm generally okay with it on like a Hyuka seal. I tend to have a free slot because even if I have Smart Link, V502, and like damage, I'm gonna end up with a free slot at the end of the game no matter what. Like I, I don't need that fourth slot for anything. I could put a Cure Unit in there, but I, I'd rather put PB Create to be honest in longer runs. Unless of course it's like a short less than 12 minute run. And if it's just like a Lily reset, I'm going to be bringing like anti EDK as my final slot or something. Or if he says part of the reason FOMR only zero units max because their stat limits are so awful, it's true. But at the same time, it means you could just pick up like a million of these, and just, there's really almost no downside. It's like, of like okay, I'm generating almost as much PV as the main party is without attacking, and then I could still bring in like Disco Brave Man plus 13 for damage and still build meter very silly. So even just having two of those on a character is ideal. But as I said before, this that's more of kind of like a late game support I would say for hunters because generally speaking you want to be holding a V501 for crowd control unless there are, unless you're in like a full party of rangers then it doesn't matter as much. So think about it that way. It really just depends on the comp. So for example, if I'm with two rangers, one's a cast, one's a human, I'm generally not going to bother with V501. I would rather just be able to build meter because rangers will probably not let me ever get a kill <laughs> if I'm with them. <laughs> so I'm like, I need the meter, chat. <laughs> I need the meter. <laughs> true story, though. It's so true. Like, how, how is the hunter going to deal with, like, uh, challenge mode, shotgun hell, <laughs> or, like, hell needle? They can't. They can't, chat. The slicer could throw, and then the enemy's dead before the slicer lands. It's so sad. But anyway, long tangent aside, let's talk about some endgame setups. So this is like, you're at least 180 plus. You're looking to determine what kinds of things I should be using in casual combat, and or you're looking for... Um, I would say upgrades to the starter kit. Actually, no, this is probably fun. So basically, the end-all be-all for most characters at the end of the game is... You want a brave disc of brave man with at least 30 hit, which is not the hardest thing to get. Ideally, you're going to have... Uh, 13 before this point, and you're going to basically be hitting with the equivalency of a 60 accuracy weapon. So, the more the better. You're going to be focusing on attributes. I'm going to put in parentheses with enemy attributes for the area. Since there comes a point where you'll get diminishing returns on the accuracy, yeah, it's just kind of like one of those ones. Oh, no, no, we talked about the government mission. <laughs> oh, we mentioned that Hellcleave. It's it's unfortunately episode. Uh, oh, wait, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, that was a different one. What, what level... Assuming it's... Assuming it's pretty early in the government, uh, here's, let's scroll down slightly. Uh, only 25 hit though, which is a bit sad. I knew it was episode 1, but it was, uh, it's, it's okay. You know what, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna say, let's, let's go above 30 hit. Let's at least put 35 hit. I think 30 hit is pretty easy to get. Should probably aim a little higher for Discovery Man. Um, aside from that, you probably want your favorite beat stick weapon to kill things with at least 30 hit plus. We talked about Jaya earlier, but let's briefly talk about Yun Chang. So if you're looking to save money, and you're looking to clear in just uh, casual areas, the raw power of Yun Chang is probably good enough for most runs. But again, if this doesn't come with hit percentage, it's probably not going to be better than like your charge partisan, and definitely not better than like a Jaya. Alternatively, if you're looking for the big bad sword alternative to cleave things. Sadly, the females can't use this option. This is Humar and Hugh only. Uh, Berserking with Zamba is, is a nice nice uh, alternative to clears. There's also the Flow and Sword 3084, which has the Spirit special. So this is more meant for the Hugh Neural, uh, and potentially the Humar over the other two options. So again, you have a lot of potentially decently high hit weapons you could have that will end up being a little better than commons. The higher hit, the better, but definitely mind your budget as you go through and make sure you don't go bankrupt. 
Alternatively, there is just the raw ATP beat stick that is the red sword. It's a little less useful from the standpoint of damage as you get higher level, but it has the flip side of if you don't use it for damage, it is a 10 target seize. I actually really like this for the special on Hugh Cassil. She's very likely to land this. It's okay on Hugh Cass if it has really high hit. But honestly, being able to seize like 10 targets at once is hilarious. And quests like Terrell's Ego, or dealing with uh, Rescue from Regal, or pretty much any, any endless that has like a million enemies in one room, like not just four of in a room, I'm talking like eight plus. Being able to shut down that entire wave with one swing is hilariously good. But again, your mileage will vary depending on what quest you have. So just be aware this is an alternative if you can't get one of those, if it's not in the trade. It's raw ATP might carry you. It benefits more from the enemy percentages than the other ones do. Uh, but I think from the standpoint of usability, it's probably the weaker of the swords. Ironically, even though it has really high ATP compared to the other weapons. Uh, we didn't talk about these three options, but there's also a single target um, option that you potentially want to pick up. So you might be picking up something like a Girasol, you might have picked up something like a Vivian earlier. Just be aware that there's also really strong options for the Hucast and Humar, so if you just want to do additional ATP damage, it's not bad. Um, technically, it, it applies Devils, which is situationally useful. I think the one that I end up using more with high hit, and I use this more as my single target beat stick. Yeah, I might bump- you know what, I'm gonna bump it a little. I'm gonna say 25 hit plus recommended. I'm gonna bump it a little for that one. Just die though. Are you gonna put 30? Fine, we'll take help use advice on the percentage there. Jizai, though, I think you could get away with slightly lower percentage. The reason why I think Jizai is really good, 30 for all those are around 20, interesting to know. So I think Jizai is one of the ones where it doesn't matter as much. So let's showcase something. Let me hide this. The reason why hit percentage doesn't matter as much for a Jizai is because you can offset its accuracy with the unit known as the Proof of Sword Saint, which we'll cover, I guess, now, slightly out of order. Basically, it's an item with a specific list of weapons that give 30 extra accuracy. Notably from this list, Excalibur is really solid to get in there. Galatine, technically Lavis Cannon. Um, otherwise, your uh, the, the Jizai here, and technically also Musashi, are the weapons you end up using it the most with in order to benefit from the high accuracy. And while this doesn't do as much as, like, potentially a charge weapon equivalency like it's not necessarily going to out damage an Excalibur per se that's berserking every hit it does have the hell special so this ends up being pretty useful for just cleaving through uh, close range enemies and can alternatively be just used as a beat stick without needing to swap weapons which is pretty useful it's the hardest hitting twin sword exactly so some, I think I like this a little more on characters like the Hugh Cast and maybe the Hugh Cassil over like the Hugh Neural. So it just kind of, it just kind of stumps everything. I don't use it as much only because I don't, ben I don't usually play the areas that would benefit from this in particular. Like some people use it for the satellite lizards in episode four. I'm okay with using other options there. But yeah, I think it can't be understated that there are some annoyingly high evasion enemies in PSO and being able to stack potentially more than one proof of sword state, which is a great endgame unit, which again, you'll potentially have as many as you can hold. And this is also why I don't run a lot of V5, honestly. Sometimes I'll just double stack proof of sword state, because having 60 accuracy on something is kind of insane. So it's like, unless I'm unless I'm like the dedicated hell unit, I think it's more hilarious to see like 60 hit on this. Yeah, it's one of those ones where like it just really depends on how often you get how often you go to places. I think if I was looking to finish off things like Epsilon, for example, or I'm looking to fight like as Kiel says like a Gibbles, I will sometimes pull this out when I'm playing single player. But I, I don't use it as much as some of the other options. Not to say it's bad, as I said before, 60 accuracy hell with any amount of hit percentage there is kind of crazy. You know what? Let's let's just bump this in general this up a little bit. We're, we're talking endgame, you might as well just bump it up a little. 
So the alternative I would say, and I like using this on some characters like the Huka Seal, technically also usable by Rangers, is Daylight Scar. This is a pretty high damaging weapon. Downside, it is a dagger, so it has super short range. I think some characters have really strong animations, like the Huka Seal in particular. It's one of the only options for Rangers, so we'll bring this up very briefly again later in the guide. Um, but it can be used to help finish off really high defense enemies. So if you're having trouble getting through, like, the raw HP of something like, I don't know, in single player, potentially an Ilgil or a Pan Arms, and you're just looking to burst them, and maybe you're the Hunural or Humar with Zalor, maybe it's important there. I've seen sometimes with some trap setups, being able to berserk on like a ranger, it could be useful as like a cast ranger in single player on similar targets. So again, your mileage will really ma will really vary depending on if you're doing a lot of general grunt clears, which I would not use this for, uh, versus just like really annoying uh, <laughs> high defense enemies or just enemies that need you to combo kill or bad things happen, which basically does not describe most of episode one outside of maybe Darkbringers. So like I would potentially use this on Darkbringers, for example, uh, but I'm not going to be using this on like Eel Chicks, Dub Chicks, the Volmers, etc. So again, it's nice to have at least one of these. You don't necessarily need all of them. We already talked about the Excalibur, so I'm not going to go through that again. It's just a great item. So basically, if you could find it with hit percentage, it's really, really strong. Otherwise, in terms of armor, there's not really too many things that are different between endgame armor choices and the ones we went over earlier. I will mention for raw defense on the Humar and the Hunural, if you're just looking to not get knocked down, let's say you're playing uh, potentially something in, in low level anguish, or honestly you just don't have like really strong debuffs, which describes a lot of characters honestly, being able to survive multi-strike attacks from things like the Sinnohs and potentially the high ATP swings of something like an Indie Belra mixed in with other attacks, for example. Having that defense is kind of nice. It's situational, it's kind of expensive, but I will state, anecdotally, this has allowed, in particular for Ramar, me to do runs I don't feel like I would otherwise be able to do because I no longer get knocked down while wearing this armor. So sometimes you do want to get knocked down when you're starting off, and I like having low HP for those scenarios to hit mag triggers and stuff like that more consistently. Uh, but at high level play, you just need to just do whatever you can to survive. And this is just another tool that it's very expensive. I would only consider this once you have a decently high level character and you have the PDs. So that's why I moved it into the end game category. And of course, for shields, there's only realistically two options you should be wearing most of the time, sadly. And that there's so many sats it goes off screen. Let me see if I can fix that. We'll, we'll do it just for red ring. We'll put it right here for now. So there's a minimum level requirement of 180, which is ridiculous. It gives 20 to most stats. It allows you to get more ATP than your character class would normally uh, allow. It allows more ATA than your class would normally allow. It's really solid resistances. It is kind of the number one shield for a reason. So pretty much everybody will run this. There's not a lot of alternate reasons to not run this. I guess if you're playing like low level things, you can run what we very briefly mentioned earlier, which was the, uh, the God Shield Kiryu. If that looks okay, yeah, that looks okay. So this one is just baby, basically a PB create built in. So technically, if you don't really need the accuracy, like you're playing something like, as I said before, early game areas, like you could be doing forests or caves, maybe you're doing surface episode 4, and your accuracy weapon is a Jizai, so you have things like Swordsman Lore to compensate for things like Satellite Lizards. It's just a free way to generate more PB. And again, its use will be more prominent in short- and not shorter quests, in longer quests. I feel like overall, Red Ring supplying that extra accuracy is generally more important. Oakley says people will use Bracer over Red Ring and Tower since like 10 more ATP, but also mainly a TA thing. That's interesting. I would have thought they would have needed the accuracy for Tower, but I guess if you get really overstatted, it's fine. Using, needing EDK or using Emerge is really the only reason not to use Red Ring. 
Yeah, I, I've seen people sometimes use alternate weapons, and like, there's reasons where the accuracy would not be as important. So if your weapons are truly, truly, truly endgame, and you're a monster sitting there with your, like, 90 hit Jaya, I don't know if you really need the Ren Ring accuracy, but for most people, you will probably end up benefiting more from the Ren Ring accuracy. Just being able to consistently power special special by having like a 30 to 50 hit weapon plus red ring is super critical. In particular, combine that with swordsman lore, and you're going to be doing that a lot on things like Excalibur. One cannot understate the benefits of accuracy at high level. That's an interesting point from Hopefully. I guess I could make a small note. I haven't been watching the time attack as much. I'll put in parentheses, ATP shields, if ATA threshold, um, not pat, not met by red rank, or already passed. Now red rank. I think that's a fair statement. Because they, they do provide 35 ATP, so they, they do provide more than what the red ring does. So we mentioned Smart Link before, but just make sure you have Smart Link on the Hunters. Most of the time you'll be using a gun at some point. Let's go ahead and talk about V101. So this is just a strict upgrade over Heavenly Battle. It's more expensive than Heavenly Battle. Heavenly Battle will take you potentially all the way to level 200, honestly. But ideally, when you're ready to hit the max stat cap, most of the time it's factored in the fact that you will be wearing a V101 in order to hit your max stats consistently. So as you get closer to like the 190 region, the 50 attack and 15 luck uh, and a little bit of accuracy do make a difference and potentially free up another slot. So just be aware that this is usually considered mandatory on most characters, unless you're like a hunter running Blue Adoshi Violet Navy down, which we mentioned earlier. So just a recap, Heavenly Arms, Adept, if not, not Max Accuracy. We talked a little bit about Swordsman Lore slash Proof of Sword Saint, which is the unsealed version of it. Um, general upgrade, V502, usable by all classes, whereas you got a 50% chance to Hell, Paralysis, Confuse, Freeze from V501. V502 does all the same things except for Hell, gets a 100% chance increase. So... If you're planning to run a lot of Episode 2, in particular Temple and Spaceship, where potentially in single player in particular, they are extremely vulnerable to just being held out of existence, in particular on lower difficulties if looking to run other hunts, uh, it is really strong. Otherwise, you'll probably be running a V801 for things like Bull Op, or honestly even just faster spellcasting in general, if, you're, if you happen to be the primary spellcaster, which is more likely to occur for Hugh New World than I would say the Humar. Just because level 20 shift the D-band and the Lord Jelen for the debuffs is somewhat common to run. You might be the only worst person in the party. Whereas Humar, it's less likely you will be the best in the party for the buffs and debuffs. But hey, it can happen, depending on your party comp. I figured I'd mention it here. So now we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, the last of the hunter items. And that will basically be talking about... S rank or challenge weapons. So we talked about this in the previous guide, but basically, with V502, it basically unlocks Hell for very easy clears episode 2, which we just mentioned. However, being able to arrest or demon a target is useful. Now let me put a note here. Um, I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna say niche alternative to Slicer Fanatic. Sometimes people will run the Slicer J Cutter for Demon. I generally don't recommend it. In fact, I'm going to lower this on the list slightly. So I don't confuse people. I do think potentially having things like your Demon Mech Guns are very powerful. Or potentially if you're in melee range a lot, like let's say you're doing Tower and you're going to be in melee range pretty much the entire time anyway. The Twin Blade is not bad for Demon procs. Um, I'm going to say solo play, uh, single player, higher priority, 
four casts. Otherwise, okay to, okay to skip. I would say from the standpoint of the Humar and the Hunural, they don't really need this weapon in particular, but the Zalor handgun in particular is kind of crucial for honestly doing any kind of reasonable damage to bosses. It's in multiplayer, not so much. In single player, yes. I think the Huka Seal is kind of in an awkward spot until you get like really, really, really high attributes from personal experience. Whereas if I just had any level of Zalor in most of those runs, the run would be like instant easy. It's not something I'm going to use on like non bosses for the most part, unless I'm really desperate to damage something like a Pan Arms in Episode 1, but. Most of the time, I'm not going to be running single-player tower, so this weapon also does not really apply to my general gameplay. But be aware, it is useful for buffs. Uh, here we talk about the upgraded Dark Flow, 65 hit point for non huka Seal, which I think I have to change anything we mentioned that earlier. There are a couple Ubers. We briefly mentioned Lava's Cannon for draining health. We also briefly mentioned uh, the Seal J Sword, or this sword. But we didn't go into any details. Let me pop this up real quick. Everyone jokes about Humar, Hugh Cast, CTF runs until you do one without S Red. Yeah, like it's it's okay. Like I, I've run it with Hugh Cast without Max ATP. It's okay. It's like I have like a 14-ish minute clear. It's not great. It it could be a lot better if I had a Zalur. I lose a lot of time on falls. I don't lose much time on anything else. Dragon boss and worm boss die so fast, it doesn't matter. It's specifically things like balls that are there. I'm kind of scared to do Olga Flow solo. <laughs> with the cast. Maybe, maybe when he hits max ATP, I'll go there. <laughs> I don't really want to deal with Olga Flow's attacks. But anyway, we briefly mentioned uh, the Sumikiri J Sword. We'll just call it the J Sword. Of this URL out of the way. There we go. And basically it allows you to drain PB, it can be used to just basically burst enemies. It's kind of a nice to have. This is kind of like the dream rare that some people aim for towards the end of the game. So this is when you are truly done. When you have all your S ranks, I would say go wild. Go ahead and purchase this item. But I would not prioritize this over Arrest or Demons or potentially Zalor if you're doing solo runs. So just be aware of that. It's a nice item, but I'm not going to value that over something like a challenge mode weapon for the other characters. So anyway. We're done with Hunter. It took a little longer than I thought, but fortunately, most of the remaining sections should go pretty quickly. So kind of similar to before. Oh, that's right, I don't have it copied anymore. Welcome, Sarah. Hope you're doing well. Kind of similar to before, you're going to be using a power mag for the most part, pretty much start to finish on this character. Yeah, I think I removed it and forgot to re-add that. The, the big difference between priorities is this item, the Ranger Wall. But this item is very, very silly. Just slightly so I can see it a little better. So this item, usable level 41, most importantly, 20 accuracy. So they basically cheat and have early access to the equivalency of Red Ring. This is pretty much a, you use it all the way until you get Red Ring's replacement. There's no reason to skip this. It adds so much accuracy. It's basically like a Heavenly Arms that doesn't require a slot, or actually more accurately, like an Adept that doesn't require a slot. And it's just such a strong item in general. I'm surprised they made this item to this in PSO. It's definitely not hard to acquire, but for people that don't want to do the minigame, uh, I really, really, really recommend you get this item. Now, I would say from the perspective of... Let me actually move this around. I'd say optionally... Check... I don't feel like repeating the same list twice. I'm just going to make sure I name this correctly. So for the most part, they only really care about Charge Vulcan and Charge Arm, uh, which are the mech guns and shotgun equivalencies, comparatively.
I just want to make sure that I'm referencing this. I don't feel like repeating this twice. We're not going to go over this again. Please check the basic hunter loadout if you skipped ahead in the video. But essentially, you need melee weapons for episode 4. Otherwise, they're honestly pretty skippable start to finish. I'm going to make sure I'm more consistent with hit. Sorry for scrolling back up again. Yeah. So we're just going to make sure that as long as you have a charge arm to deal with groups and you have a charge Vulcan to deal with everything else, that is the preference. You could technically sub out with Berserk. I'm going to say... Note. Charge preferred. Do not benefit as heavily as Hunter. Common. Yeah, the reason being that from the standpoint of Rangers, they don't need to lower their health for anything. So if you don't need to lower your health, just generally don't do it. <laughs> Unless you're looking to, to like scrape by and save some cash. Maybe it's okay. So if you happen to have it from the Hunter set, that's fine. But otherwise, I think from that perspective... These two weapons will carry you basically the entire game. They're kind of insane. They're gonna kill basically everything except for bosses. GG. Speaking of GG... Here's one that you want to pick up early if you're looking to be prepared. I would argue that you could, should probably trade, or you should probably hunt for this rather than trade for it, but I'm still going to list it here for people that purely do not want to do the hunts and just want to go right into the character creation, and that is the Frozen Shooter. The reason why this is so strong is that its special attack uses heavy attack power and accuracy. Let me hide this. It has infinite vertical range, so it can hit some flying enemies. It shuts down basically everything in the game, and it is just absolutely wonky. Yeah, it's just, this is pretty much a staple, a lot of endgame runs, even though the damage is low, you're going to be using this on basically every enemy as a support role, and even in solo play, it's used all the time. The ability to shut down an enemy with a guaranteed freeze as long as you hit them is crazy. It's crazy. Freezing enemies reduces their evasion. So if you have hunter friends with you, or force friends that are trying to land demons, you have now basically given them ranger level accuracy, equivalency, which is pretty funny. And then for you, you're basically able to special, special, special a lot of, the tar a lot of these targets at endgame as long as they're frozen. Which just leads to tons of damage or tons of status ailments. Yeah, and the fact that it's only heavy um, accuracy means that it's not super hard to land, there's a few key enemies that are very evasive. I think of what I call the fidget spinners, I believe they're called Delvefs in Episode 2, that really warrant you getting a hit percentage version of this gun. But honestly, for like 90% of the game, an all-zeroed Frozen Shooter is so good that it's just worth the 1 PD to shut down everything early, to be honest with you. It is, it is that good without any stats. That's why I don't even bother listing any stats with it. It is just honestly wild. Uh, up next on the list, we'll go to Spread Needle. So this one has a slightly worse uh, paralysis special. The difference is that this weapon shoots really fast. Like, it says the type is rifle, but it shoots much faster uh, than I would say you would expect from, like, a shotgun perspective. Since it has five shots, has kind of short range, definitely way less than a handgun. But at point blank, this is a lot of AoE chances to paralyze, which is more useful in the Rock Cast and Rock Seal, I would say, where they're more interested in potentially rolling this with hit percentage uh, and take advantage of their natural cast bonus to paralyze. However, this weapon is still really good on a lot of enemies. It could stun lock with just normal, normal, normal strings. You could use it to shoot bosses like Vault Op to stun lock the monitors. It's just a really solid overall item and it's just it, it's one of those kind of like game changing items it, it will be a little outclassed depending on if you're like a human character versus like something like a 
uh, I think it, well, actually, it, it notes it there, the ES Needle. It is slightly outclassed by ES Needle for, uh, human characters, but I would say for casts, this ends up being a beginner item, an endgame item, and a support item, and basically everything in between. The ability to just rapidly hit five targets can't be understated how useful that is, whether you're dealing with, uh, groups of Dwarfons, or you're dealing with annoying, um, Pretty much anything, honestly. Groups of groups of annoying anything, it shuts them down pretty hard. Let's hide this. Let's go back to the list. So up next, the other game-changing item that I feel like is worth picking up early. If you are a cast, I recommend getting it with a little bit of hit percentage. If you're a Ramar... Actually, let me just add this in here. I'm gonna say 15 hit plus preferred or non-Ramar. <laughs> Ramar is so busted, chat. He doesn't even need he doesn't even need the hit up in order to be effective with this. It, it is so silly how high his accuracy goes. Like honestly, I think in like to give an example on Worm Boss, in multiplayer, he has a 96% chance of landing it with no accuracy up. Like this character is ridiculous. Every other character, it would probably benefit to help them get up to the Ramar accuracy. So probably the min-rolled accuracy is good enough. Otherwise, for Ramar, you could get away with purely nature or A-Beast because he's very silly. In single player, you don't even arguably need it at all. But this weapon is fantastic. It hits up to 10 targets. It's very useful for hitting multi-segmented enemies like the Worm Bosses and the Dragon Bosses. So you're going to see this being used to anti-air them, since it also seems to, more often than not, uh, hit very easily flying targets compared to some other guns. It also almost has basically sniper range, because sniper range is 210, this is 200, handguns are 170. So it's just a nice long-range poke option on those kinds of enemies. You won't be using this in casual encounters, since it can't combo, sadly. Um, technically, it also is a confused special. I almost never see anybody try to land this. Because of the fact that it's combo locked, you would need to have high enough accuracy to always land the special, which is just not realistic to attain. If it wasn't combo locked, I would say people would be using it for sure for that, but it is a little unfortunate there. However, it is just a really solid option on a majority of the bosses of the game. In fact, if you get high enough attribute and a little bit of hit percentage for episode 4 boss, this also ends up being a really, really good option versus episode 4 boss as an alternative. Uh, for rangers. So just be aware, this is just kind of the boss killer. It, it will just be able to troll basically everything. I think I also troll with this when we play specifically Respective Tomorrow, and there's like the room with the pan arm, and then the, the guild chick spawn, or the dub chick spawn, and then behind you is the dub switch, where you can hit the pan arm with, and hit the freeze trap, and hit the, the switch all at once. There's like really cheesy, dumb things you could do to trap shoot with this. Because of the fact that it shoots such a big explosion, it can hit basically anything. So, uh, also, since it can hit almost anything, you could just choose to directly target dub switches ahead of time, and that includes if they're through walls. So this is just really useful in areas like mines and spaceship in general. Murphy's saying, high evasion monsters, specifically Del Saber, Old Gibbons. Oh, yeah, Del Saber is probably the most common one. I forgot the Gibbons were... I guess the Gibbons are decently up there. Yeah, unfortunately, they're basically everything that you see in, like later areas is just more annoying than it should be. Yeah, Ilgil is very annoying to hit for sure. When you're ready to fight like your annoying swarm of uh, other enemies, it is what it is. I would say for the most part, I don't worry about Del Saber as much just because of the fact that unlike those other enemy types, you can kind of cheese it with Rebarda. So that way you could just land the frozen shooter when you need it. Otherwise, I guess if you're a cast, you probably want higher hit percentage. Yeah, Ilgil is just... Il Ilgil is Ilgil. <laughs> that, that's where you start needing the hit percentage. When you want to do tower and, and freeze those annoying seabed monsters, trying not to get dodged by the robots in episode 2, when you break it out. Yeah, cast just freeze trap. They might even fire trap into it if they're desperate. But anyway, we talked about this before with the Hunter. I'm not going to go into many details. Heavenly Arms, 25 accuracy, Adept. 20 accuracy, but gives 6 to all resistances, and 10 in most other stats. The reason people might use this for uh, Ramar and Ramarl is because it reduces the TP cost for spirit specials as well, 
and it helps if you're playing a more supportive role, if you're the only person casting buffs and debuffs on the party, but it's more of a minor optimization early, and it can be skipped. I, I do find this a little more useful on uh, rangers than hunters, but I think it's more useful on forces than both of these characters. Next up, we have, like, the absolute... The absolute best... one of the, uh, Is it the best handgun in the game? It is definitely one of the best guns in the game. Heaven Striker. This thing has so much utility, I don't even know where to begin with this. I guess I could put optional... You know what? I'll put an optional thing in here for the mandatory. I think I talk about it later, but just in case I don't talk about it later. And optionally... It's Striker Unit. Bag, if looking to do so for solo runs. Yeah, it's the highest ATP handgun. Most importantly, it has a ridiculous special. So it says C page. So by default, it has an auto aim. I think it's pistol range. Or is it shotgun? Shot range. I'm sorry, it's a shotgun range. Shotgun range has, let's confirm, 130. So it's less than pistol, which can be kind of annoying on some fights. Otherwise, it shoots as far away as the sniper, which is ridiculous. But the fact that it auto-aims means that it often will hit things that you really realistically shouldn't be able to hit. Like, you would think that with less range, it would be more annoying to hit enemies that are above you directly. Because of the fact that most of the time when you have to aim with guns, you have to have, like, line of sight. Heaven Striker doesn't care about that. <laughs> Is is Oga Flow like millions of meters or feet in the air off screen and hasn't landed yet? Who cares? It just shoots straight upwards. The bullet will go straight vertical, which is insane. I, I can't believe they let it in like that. So number one, basically near infinite vertical height, which is ludicrous for certain enemies anyway, and just absolutely trolls on those enemies. Number two, it's such a high ATP weapon that the Berserk Special often will, will result in combo kills, even though it's not a charged Vulcan with its multiple hits. The fact that you could just do this constantly and clear entire rooms this way is hilarious. It also scales way, 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 way stronger with uh, the enemy attributes compared to most other Berserk options in the game. I mean, the fact that this is like a 550 to 660 range weapon with 20 grind means that even if you consider like the minimum percentage, if you got like 10 in native, you're still adding more than 55 ATP effectively per 10%, which is insane. That is an insanely high amount on a gun. I mean, we were looking at Frozen Shooter earlier, it was like, what, 230 to 260 or something like that? Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It's super good against high defense enemies. Murphy actually just beat me to it. It's super good against high defense enemies is point number three. Point number four. It pairs with a mag called the Striker Unit. So, like, it, I feel like this gun is the... And wait, there's more. Because this gun just never ends. This gun is so good at everything. It really is, like, the gun you will end up hunting. Guaranteed as a ranger. You will need an ID that can hunt this eventually. But to get started, in order to do some of those runs, if you combine this with the Striker Unit, you get something called the Divine Punishment, which we'll leave as an image in the corner. So this thing does light damage during even B. It AoEs multiple targets, it has a range of 150, it could be used to cheese things like spinners, it could be used to cheese satellite lizards, it deals with episode 4 boss, and then if you don't want that, you just swap into your standard bag and you berserk special boss. It's just like, wow. Oh, poor Hellcleave. We'll get Hellcleave a hit percentage Heaven Striker. That'll be the goal of the year. Dangles, Parasitic Gene Flow, Hell Cleaves, Hit Percentage, X Hell Heaven Striker. How's that? I want you to know, it's officially being written down. Goals of the year. We're taking time out of our guide to note it. That's how important it is. But yeah, this item is like one of the best items in the game. Frozen Shooter with its utility is absolutely insane. But this weapon is just the absolute absolute one of my favorite weapons it's so clearly overpowered and i i love it <laughs> never change i feel bad for people that are playing uh potentially purist mode on episode one and two as you will not have the pew pew lasers that you see in the corner but man oh man it does it does everything it just really does everything 
Uh, we'll put up as a reminder. I'm not going to go into details. We did this earlier in the Hunter Guide. Unfortunately, there is a lot of overlap, but I feel like for people that are looking for classes, I'll briefly put this up. Triple target Saber, really strong ATP, really good against full off due to how it calculates the damage. Um, you can, in theory, use Galatine as well, so I'll put that up as a reminder from earlier. Uh, both of these potentially do a lot of damage, so if you have Adept and you'd like to use Spirit and you'd like to basically one-shot high HP priority targets, this might be good. If you're looking for more general crowd clear or boss kill, you might get more mileage out of Excalibur. Excalibur generally is more situations in which it is useful. That's not to say that Galatine can't just one-shot really annoying groups of Darkbringers that are spread out as you just slowly combo kill them one by one by one and have your way with them with the absolutely... I just want to point this out actually for the Ranger. Like, Frozen Shooter only has 60 accuracy as a sniper, I'm pretty sure. This sword, for some reason, has 77 accuracy. Why? I never understood this. Ever since I noticed that, it has bothered me. This is like so... So high in accuracy, it's insane. I don't understand why it's like it, like that, but whatever. And then finally, wrapping up the end game, or not end game, wrapping up the starter kit items for the Ranger. We talked about this in detail with the Hunter, so I'll try to keep it brief. B501 is used basically for two things for Ranger Par Paralysis Hell. So you can make, uh, you could use an Arrest Ray Gun or Laser 50 hit. Either version of these is fine. Alternatively, the Spread Needle we mentioned earlier is also fine. Laser is just a sniper version of the uh, of Ray Gun. It is slower, so generally it's not as preferred in rooms that are kind of tighter together. It's actually better to be using Ray Gun in those scenarios, because it's literally faster to shoot that over Laser. But there are some annoying groupings of enemies, like if you're playing RT and you're trying to hit the Gs that are like really, really spread out, and you might not have everybody optimal with Hell, I would probably lean more towards Laser than Ray Gun in those scenarios to prevent myself from walking as much. And again, sometimes the extra accuracy of Laser does make a difference. So for example, if you're using Hell Laser on uh, Raw Cast, for example, I might get more advantage of that than the accuracy bonus of Ramar using it kind of things. I'm going to give a special shout out to a weapon called the SB Blade. Show that example here. So it is technically usable across uh, Hunter and Ranger. In theory, I could go back and I guess add this to Hunter. Yes. Don't recall if I put it up there. But essentially, it's a enemy part weapon that you could guarantee. Oh, I did put it there. Okay, okay, okay. I just don't think we went into like a lot of conversation with it. So from the perspective of the weapon itself. It's basically one of the first weapons you could guarantee has a 50 hit, so you might get one without hit, and you might have to get Photon Crystals in order to upgrade it. So just be aware that this is just an enemy part weapon. It is useful because you have multiple chances of proccing Hell. I'd like it a little more for Huka Seal, but it's not bad on some of the other characters. But for example, like, Ramar is basically never going to miss with this. Ramar is basically never going to miss with this. So it's not a bad option for those two characters. It's okay on Rock Seal and Rock Cast, it's also fine-ish, I guess. But sadly, with only 35 accuracy, it's it's not quite a Galatine in accuracy. So some enemies might be more annoying to hit in multiplayer than they should be. Let's continue onwards. So... Do this, actually. So I, I'm gonna push this. I love Slicer Fanatic. We're gonna bring this up for every character class. We'll leave it up in the corner for people that were skipping ahead through the YouTube video. Three targets, demons, SN glitch, beautiful. I I recommend this on basically every character. I, I don't I don't regret pushing this. This is one of my favorite items in the game. It is just so strong. Otherwise, if you're looking for just single target options, there is the demon ray gun, demon laser option. We didn't talk about this because the Hunter couldn't use this before, but this is a nice option to hold over potentially for forces. If you're playing Ranger and Force, I will generally have one of these floating in a bank at any given time. It is 63 base accuracy, which is really good, so you're going to get a lot more out of that than some of your other options. Let's compare it to Laser. Laser is just 50 normally, so with 50 hit added to this, it's basically like having a 63 hit demon laser equivalency. Plus, it is the side benefit of being usable by forces. 
So if you're willing to spend a little more in terms of securing a really strong demon option, it is really, 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 really good. And one cannot understate how badly you need accuracy on enemies in tower and all those annoyingly high accuracy enemies. So the fact that you will be using this on a human character that doesn't have a consistent, um, I would say freeze option in something like mines or maybe it's just really hard to hit the initial hit of freeze on certain targets because you don't have a hit percentage frozen shooter. Uh, having this up there is probably good enough in multiplayer. So we talked about this item as well before, I'm just going to briefly go through it since I do not want to repeat for the people that have been sitting through the guide so far. Twin Blaze, having a Gafoli special, really solid. ATP range is kind of a little too big for like a consistent beat stick, but it could be okay in a pinch if you're looking to limit how many items you're holding. So sometimes the single target damage is okay, but I usually prefer something with a more strictly tighter range, like a Girasol, which has a 5... 500 to 550 range, even though in theory they have similar max damage caps. The fluctuation by itself kind of wards me away from this. Also, this item grants 40 MST for some reason, which is somewhat relevant for learning level 20 techs sometimes, if you don't have enough Heavenly Minds to learn stuff early. I figured I'd just throw that, that out there. Um, otherwise, for female characters... Let me make sure we put Girasol in here. Actually, I don't know where I rate Gearsol on a male character. I'll, I'll think about it. Damage rage is funny, it makes the shifter work better, but also makes the combos more unreliable. Yeah, it's kind of like in that awkward state between... It's like, I like it, but I don't like it. Females, however, just have a much stronger beat stick option. We talked about this with the Hunter, but the fact that it has this raw damage and it multi-hits just makes sure that it's just really good at picking off uh, kind of annoying enemies. And honestly, like, raw moral with Shifta and Zaloring a target means you basically combo kill everything with this. So, I, I don't know. I, I can't push this weapon enough. It's really good. I recommend this across every class. And then finally, I think Romaro benefits a little less than, like, the Hugh Casile does. In the sense that, like, at least early on, you can usually power, power, power as, like, a Hugh Casile. I would say the Romaro gets a little more bonus over the Hugh Neural, because Hugh Neural's accuracy is so mediocre <laughs> that Romaro is more likely to power, power, power in scenarios where the Hugh Neural isn't. But I still find this weapon extremely useful. It's just a good cleanup early on, especially if you can't get those other options through training. Or training, excuse me. And I just feel in general, it's just a really good PB builder. So if you're looking to basically do a lot of damage and you need to get Mag Blast, I will state that this weapon is really good at still killing combo kill wise while still building you Photon Blast. I think that's just a really nice alternate version uh, for people to have. So we talked about a few of these options. A lot of the armors will be the same across all the characters, sadly. So we'll keep it brief. Stealth Suit, Reminder, gets rid of Slingshot, makes it faster to Telepipe. Terrible defensive item. Unless you're looking for evasion, then in theory it could be useful against Episode 4 boss since you want to use Dolphin Attack. Slash Estella potentially to finish off some of the boss. Human characters can go towards, I guess, Sacred Cloth if they want to free up a slot for Cure Paralysis in a run. If trap clearing is a priority, and Rangers are pretty good at clearing traps, Lieutenant Mantle allows the Ramar and Ramarl the ability to basically deal with them with the shotgun long distance. It might remove Sting Frame from here, but I'll make a brief mention to it. It eventually becomes the Virus Armor, which we talked about earlier with other characters. I just feel like there's less exciting options for other people, and the EDK is actually somewhat surprisingly decent on Rangers. I just feel like there's more Hunter options, and that's why I ended up not putting it there, but I might change my mind later. For Cass, it's usually this armor, the Deep Hearts version 1.01. 1 
purely because 35 ATP is so good with how the monster attributes work. For casts, you have the Blackhound Carace, which is just a solid defensive item if you're looking to survive the beatdown of enemies. Otherwise, the same items we talked about earlier with Dressplate providing 70 EDK, but no other meaningful resistances means it's probably your go-to for caves. Brightness Circle is kind of a more well-rounded one where it has some light resistance and dark resist, which can be useful for falls in general just to make sure you hit the minimum EDK to survive. But the general stat line of two or up to 240 defense means that it's also a pretty good defensive option alternative over the more expensive virus armor uh, alternative off this thing frame. And finally, if you're willing to burn a lot of PDs, uh, the ability to stand near other male characters and get up to a 25% ATP bonus can be pretty helpful, but again, that's dependent on your party comp and also dependent on the quest that you're running. So just be aware that you can wield this early-ish, but it's situational. I love for shield options, chat. I just called it the right choice 90% of the time. I'm gonna be honest with you, you should probably never swap out a ranger wall unless you're looking to do something very, 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 very specific. So, for example, if you, for whatever reason, are so over accuracy in something like a falls fight, you might benefit from Yadamir's Foey bonus damage, maybe? Maybe, but that's like extreme late game. Combat gear is basically just a worse version of Yadamir. I don't generally recommend this unless you're sharing it between characters. I would say only arguably if you're in some really, really specific quests will you run something like Anti-Dark Ring on the Ranger. Just because of the fact that while well, Hunters do have some good ATP options compared to the Ranger, um, the Ranger wall is just so powerful. Its ability to land Hell or other specials or even just being able to normal hit some of the high accuracy enemies means you're going to be using it in basically every quest for every scenario, including bosses. Like, technically, you might not need Ranger Wall with a hit percentage Cannon Rouge on Dragon, for example. Like, there's scenarios I can think of where you don't benefit from the accuracy and ATP would be more normalized, but this is, like, really, 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 really specific. Yeah... It's just one of those things, Chad. It's just just stick to Ranger Wall. If you're not sure, Ranger Wall will say will basically serve you all the way until level 180. And honestly, if you're not looking to get Red Ring, it'll serve you all the way to level 200. To be honest, Ranger Wall is just honestly that good. It really is. I can't understate how unfair that item is. So finally, we're just talking about boss optimization. So, if you're fighting something like Worm Boss, you don't have access to, like, a Jaya to hit the multi-segment boss. But Excalibur is a pretty good option for it. Uh... So, also, if you're just looking for a generic beat stick on things like Darkbringers, etc. Also put Galatine here, again, as a reference. Actually, no, no. I put this under boss optimization. So... Excalibur being able to triple hit is important on things like Worm Boss, and sometimes it matters on some other enemies. Like, for example, you can technically double hit Lilies, and you can one-shot them very easily with Ranger that way if you want to. Uh, but generally speaking, you have better options to do against most of these other enemies. You want to have some 50-hit single-target uh, weapons, for example, if you're going against Olga Flow at a distance or if Falls happens to get really close. You probably want the standard single target weapons of Vulcans and Vice, but be aware that the the Heaven Striker is just so useful on some of the other bosses. I think we include that later in the list. Um, if you're really not sure, Disco Rayman 13 is such a powerful combination on all characters. Technically, it's still useful on Rangers, but for the most part, you have Charge Arm. So you have a bit more flexibility than I would say the Hunter if you really don't want to do the Slicer route, since some of the Slicer animations are kind of bad across the characters. Just be aware that if you don't want to wear specifically this armor, which boosts 
Disco Brave Man's ATA by 30, more than the cap that you would normally have, and it also it's weapon ATP, that it's probably fine to skip the slicer. As long as you have something like a charge arm, you should be carried pretty hard. Otherwise, for your other kinds of bosses, Cannon Rouge, pretty much regardless the stats will kill Dragon. I won't even say native preferred. Dragon just doesn't have enough health to survive you if you're near max ATP. So it generally doesn't matter what you bring to the boss fight. Characters like the Hue Cast and potentially the Raw Cast do enough damage with Charge Vulcan that technically they don't need the Cannon Rouge as long as they can land the specials. So just be aware of that, that there are alternatives to that. Now, if you're coming into the Worm Boss, you can use a generic Beat Stick like Excalibur in order to deal with them. Let me make sure this is the right weapon one second. Okay, it was just being very finicky with me for some reason. So the Rena of Fiaven is not too hard to acquire, or excuse me, the SNR5. Is not too hard to acquire. I would say from the standpoint of normal hunts, I would probably do this over a trade. It could be used in a pinch as long as it comes with a beast. And honestly, for the most part, I think that the Ramar doesn't really need a lot of hit percentage, if any. The cast will need that bonus. So basically, it's a weapon that can fire a single shot. So if you hit with a heavy attack, it's going to be doing basically a 550 piercing attack, which can be useful in the worm bosses. However, if you end up with a really strong cannon rouge, like if you happen to have a cannon rouge with a beast and a little bit of hit percentage if you're one of the casts, then you could just alternatively just spam Cannon Rouge in the same scenarios. Bull Op is kind of in a similar scenario. We mentioned before in many of our guides, but basically, as long as you're holding a really high ATP weapon and you have V801, you can basically stunlock the uh, monitors and defeat the boss very quickly. I'm not going to go into many details there. Just be aware that Sacred Duster uses fist animation, so it's a little quicker with Ramar, uh, since males get a bonus to that. Otherwise, you could just use Spread Needle to solo stunlock. This is probably the most universal and easiest thing to acquire, since most rangers should have this anyway. Otherwise, if you're a cast or really desperate, you could use Twin Blaze. Now, there are a couple options that I think are a little more niche, and that's where I want to kind of draw attention to them. I can't believe I didn't list Heaven Striker here. Definitely put Heaven Striker there. But there are times when some of the bosses go outside of your normal attack range. So while there aren't a lot of options for uh, the hunters to deal with them, there are ironically a decent amount of options for horses and rangers to deal with them. So one option that I like to do if the boss is playing Ring Around the Rosie with me is I do like to have the Yashminikov as a backup. So what I'll end up doing is if the boss is outside of Vulcan or Heaven Striker auto-aim range, I'm going to be hovering in my quick menu most of the time at Yashminikov 9000M, in particular if I'm playing a cast. So that way, no matter what, I could just unload my DPS full screen. So basically, the main appeal from it is not its damage range or even its accuracy. It's more the fact that 210 is sniper accuracy or sniper range, so you can just hit this boss no matter what. Um, alternatively, in theory, you could still use the LNK combat. For them, they need a little less... You don't need, like, 50 or 60 hit with this to be useful. However, you do need a pretty high dark percentage for it to be useful in a Ranger, since most of the time you'll be using this on Hucast. If you're playing as a Hunter, but from the Ranger perspective, landing the shot with a Heavy is not really all that difficult with Ramar. In fact, you could get away with pretty low hit percentage most of the time, even in multiplayer. But the problem is, is you really, really, really need the uh, dark percentage to make up for that. So unless this rolls super well, I tend to avoid this gun over other choices. Otherwise, uh, there's Last Swan for dealing with the boss at a decent distance, since it's a pistol range multi-shot, so if for whatever reason the boss goes like past the halfway point away from you in the arena. It doesn't make sense to take time to reposition to hit with Vulcans. Last Swan's not a bad option in order to just multi-strike there. So if you have a Heaven Striker, 
with dark percentage and hit percentage. I would actually value this a little higher over Last Swan. The reason being that Last Swan does a lot of really solid damage, but if you have a Heaven Striker with, let's say, even just like 30 or 40 dark, and you have one with 20 or 30 hit, you're actually going to be able to land the Berserk special on most of the Rangers. So, it just goes from maybe a normal Heavy Heavy, which does good damage, but isn't necessarily going to compete with the Last Swan or even a Master Raven's base damage. Having the Dark Percentage and the Hit Percentage to land the Berserk makes a really big difference. So don't sleep on that. I'm going to say Single Target. I'm going to say Vulcan. Do I have something generic for that? I'll just make a note that you can use the standard single target of the vices if they get close. Olga Flow is pretty much the same thing. Except Heaven Striker special hits boss at the start off screen. <laughs> so I'm gonna specifically mention this for people that were curious. So Olga Flow gets absolutely dumpstered by Heaven Striker. It is hilarious how much damage you could do with this with Ramar off screen. So if you have anybody debuffing, or if you're playing Raw Moral, for example, use the lore into this. It's so dumb in single player as well as multiplayer. Uh, finally, I think for just uh, episode 4 boss, I would probably rotate the order a little bit. Move this around. I prefer the Divine Punishment build because it doesn't have any damage variants. So Pew Pew Lasering with Heaven Striker plus Striker unit and... Uh, MST boosters uh, in order to do more damage but Divine Punishment is pretty solid otherwise Charge Arm is okay Cannon Rouge if it has enough percentage is also really good so funny enough if you have a Cannon Rouge with relatively high I believe it's dark for the episode 4 bosses plus if it has something like A Beast you can end up just using this on basically every boss in the game. It's kind of silly. I guess I'll also mention specifically also Gal Griffin. Gal Griffin also gets dumpstered by Cannon Rouge. Like honestly, it's like Cannon Rouge deletes most bosses and whatever bosses it has trouble with. Usually Heaven Striker is the answer. <laughs> and, if, and if that's somehow not the answer, then it's usually just like a Charge Vulcan or something like that. Rangers have it easy. They have a lot of really great options, and those options cover so many different scenarios. They don't, they don't need to worry about necessarily holding 12 items at once. With, like, five weapons, they can clear basically everything in every scenario. But for some other runs, maybe you'll run more items. Riffy says Ramar needs 50 hit, guaranteed heavy on LNK versus final form, but only 20 of 80% chance. Yeah, it's one of those ones where, like, even just, like, a min roll 15 hit is probably fine. I think that's an important point to bring up the breakpoints. Maybe I'll be more specific in there. So, I'll, I'll leave it like that. I think that's more specific. Maybe that'll be more helpful for people shopping. It's not, like, super crazy. But I, I think without the dark percentage, I just don't like this gun as much over something like a Charge Vulcan or some of these other options, sadly. Like, I would very much rather full screen Yashmenikov than LNK, unless the LNK is like really, really, really specced out. Just because of the fact that it's just a mech gun that does your damage. So I get nine hits of potentially all, all power attacks versus five hits. Just like, might be better depending on dark percentage, but again, that's just kind of it. It really depends on the item. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details here. Just be aware that there are ways you can squeeze out a little damage. Let me also just make a note here. That once you're done with basically going forward with the all power and luck combination, which you should have gotten 
fairly early on in the ranger life. I think we skipped over specifically where it was, but pretty much once you have your basic items, you just start pumping your power before you get something like Excalibur. Most of your weapons fortunately only care about accuracy, so if you want to land something like a Heaven Striker, you kind of need the Heavenly Arms for it. Frozen Shooter isn't as strict with it. Just be aware of that. Check your ATA totals depending on your uh, character level. See how badly you need it to equip those items. But, that in mind. Same advice as before. Only at really high level do you really care about your max stat mag. Or, uh, same. Say mid max. So that'll be more clear. And then, alternatively, as you slowly don't need Heavenly Arms because your accuracy is capping, you can squeeze out a little extra ATP as you level, in particular if you are switching over to the min-max uh, material plans, by just wearing a Centurion ability, Heavenly ability, or Heavenly power, depending on how your materials are. But, again, this is like super, super niche. Don't worry, don't worry about it if you're not sure. <laughs> That's my rule of thumb. If you're not sure, it's probably okay to skip it uh, when it comes to these units. Otherwise, I would say because of the fact the Ramar and Ramarl have such ridiculously high accuracy, you actually want to go for alternate machine guns to squeeze out additional damage. So while Hunters may or may not benefit from it because they would prefer the accuracy over the raw ATP, getting something like a Type ME mech gun can be kind of good. Because normally Vulcans have a damage range of 5 to 20 and at most get a grind of 9. This has a grind of 30, and the damage range is less variable. So, like, you squeeze out a little bit more ATP, which can matter as you level, especially if you're playing, like, Ramar and Ramarl, who already can basically special, special, special everything in, like, single player, at least in, like, forests and caves, anyway. So, from that perspective, having a... Yeah. So, having, having this, like, small boost in damage is an optimization just to make sure you're able to hit your numbers. So just in case you're not quite at max ATP, I think this matters a little more. Just be aware of that. Um, I don't think that mag is spelled correctly. No, it is not. So minor optimization. This is under the wrong thing, one second. Uh, that's fine. I think what I'm going to do here, since I already talked about this, I'm not going to repeat it here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to move this here, under the, the clip note here. So, there is a mag you can get towards the end of the game that potentially you'll have to hit your min-max. Realmars are kind of in a weird position because they... They can't get a lot of the standard mag evolutions, and what I mean by that is that most characters can have 45 dex, 5 defense, and 50 attack power and upgrade into their min-max mag. Ramars are an example of where that is not true. They want to have less than 45 dex, therefore they can't make certain mag combinations and still hit their guaranteed uh, min-max stat recommendations. So alternatively, what people will end up doing, there's a lot of options you could do it, but this is just one of them. You could get something known as the Dragon Scale, and level it up to level a comma up to at least level 50, slash the comma has to be at least level 50, and then you could feed it the Dragon Scale, and it turns it into the to Lucius. So this particular item has 55 invincibility across the board. It's useful basically everywhere. It's It's pretty good. So it's better than trying to go for a non-standard mag. You should probably look into mag cells if you're playing a Ramar in particular to make sure that you hit the option that makes sense for you. Since some people care a little bit more about stronger uh, 100 PB chance, some people care more about the boss trigger chance. This one is just a generically really good mag, so I'm just going to recommend it here. We talk about this in more detail in the other guides, but I figure from a trading perspective, it's probably the easiest one to ask for. So we'll leave it there. So if you haven't already done it, make sure to switch over to the 50 Hitbringers rifle. It's just going to be better than the Demon's rifle and Ray Gun, except for in the scenarios where you are looking to quickly deal with a small 
group of enemies in a small room, I guess if that makes sense. Just because the demon ray gun speed is useful. But otherwise, at high-end play, you're probably going to be bringing out the Breaker's Rifle full-time. Now, they don't have to worry about things like Spartlings, since Rangers naturally have the equivalency of Smartlings, so they don't take damage or accuracy penalties at distance. So, they have a bit more freedom with their units. Which, again, we're going to push the PP Create, PP Increase, depending on what you're doing. But all the Cure units are still useful. If you haven't learned all the texts and you're just like a fresh level 80 character, maybe the Mind unit and Mind Mag is useful. So the, the stats on the Mind Mag don't matter as much. It could be like a 15 defense, 185 MST Rappy Mag. That's like a good big example. Which could end up being used to help power level your forces as well. Sometimes rangers have trouble surviving Epsilon, so things like Heavenly HP sometimes matter, but more often than not, they don't. Uh, basically, Heavenly HP adds 100 per unit, God HP adds 80. Generally speaking, as you get higher level, it's less and less useful since you should hit those caps. In particular for Raw Casts and Raw Seal, they really don't need to worry about hitting their HP totals. Like, don't don't worry about it with those characters. That's more like if you're looking to squeeze in an early low-level Ramar and he needs to survive the nonsense of set damage to the higher level areas, maybe you'll do it because you have a free unit, unlike some of the other classes. Uh, we have Cleo here, which gives a boosted range to Zalor. If you're playing a Raw Marl and you're the only person casting debuffs, this is just kind of a nice item to have to make rooms a bit more consistent, because you don't have the natural range of a level 30 force technique. So being able to increase the range of this is actually kind of important in more runs, whereas I would say it's increasingly niche for forces. I would say it's just a lot more useful for Raw Marl. Similarly, if you're looking to buff people at a distance, Shift Emerge is there. I personally don't use it, but I figured I'd mention it for people looking to support people more easily. Attack Power Up is usually the thing you want to make sure you apply to everybody in the room. I guess from that standpoint, I don't think I mentioned Terrell's here. We mentioned it earlier with the percentage, but it gives a uh, Resta... Uh, shift a D-band boost. So you might just have like an all zero statted one and you just use that just if you're playing a support role. Otherwise, uh, in terms of EDK, a not bad option actually in order to make sure that you survive as a female character is Rupika. So if you combine that with Brightness Circle from earlier, you end up with 50 EDK total. So if you happen to also then have like an adept for accuracy and then also one unit for dark resistance, you could push yourself to about 81 dark resistance, which is usually good enough for most areas. If you don't have the adept, sometimes you might not be purely immune. And it, it's it's probably also fine in those scenarios. So just be aware. You can also just double adept. I think double adept with those is also fine because it puts you at 62 EDK. Which is like, quote unquote, close enough, if you know what I mean. So just consider those things if you're going to do lily runs. Generally, the females have a lot more trouble surviving the lilies. Uh, just from that standpoint, they don't have an easy dress plate. So it's like, it, it's okay. Think about it. Think about it. Generally speaking, though, it's unfortunate they don't have a really super strong armor option. Just because of the fact that you would generally prefer to keep Ranger Wall on. But sometimes, sometimes you need to swap out your shield. So I'm going to put that as a quality of life item. I'm not going to recommend this over most of the other options. But just be aware that if you're looking to live the Lily life, you're going to need to come up with some really good, either really consistent, no no damage taken, no Lily, fire, or no, no lily shots fired approach, or you just need to be immune. One of the above. And unfortunately for the Raw Marl, she also needs to balance that with the Cure Paralysis, so her life is kind of brutal. You, you you think she'd be really solid at clears, but... I think the Ramar fortunately doesn't have that problem. He wears Dress Plate, puts on a Cure Paralysis, laughs at enemy. He just doesn't care. Maybe one of his shields will incidentally give him EDK. He doesn't really care. 
Uh, but since you end up having usually a, another free unit over the other classes, if you're relying on Hell a lot and you're relying on things like Paralysis or playing mostly assist roles, you actually don't build a lot of meter. If you're if you're fighting bosses with Cannon Rouge, that's probably the opposite of the case where you build up so much meter you don't know what to do with it, just because Cannon Rouge usually dumpsters bosses. But if you're using things like the Berserk Specials on Heaven Striker or Charge Arm, which you'll pretty much be using all the time due to your high accuracy, you also don't build up as much meter as you think you would normally get. So PB create is 1 PB every 23 seconds as a reminder, and PB increase is 1 in every 18. PB increase just being the more expensive alternative. So sometimes it matters. I still say that if for any reason you end up AFKing or plan to AFK at some point, or potentially will AFK in a run, it will just build you free meter. If you're playing casts, it just makes sure you hit shift to D-band faster, so that way you can take advantage of it in single player. And then you can unequip it when you don't when you no longer need it, as an example. Otherwise, unless the quest really starts going beyond 12 minutes, it's arguable whether you should bring it at all. If it's a quest that goes like 15 minutes, 13 minutes, 20 minutes, I absolutely would wear this on the character. Maybe not for the whole run, but at least for like four minutes or so, just to make sure I get it before like a certain room or a certain boss. But anyway. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. We don't have too much more to talk about with the Ranger. We have some options here, which we mentioned earlier. We'll try to speed through it. So 13, Disco Brave Man. AoE clear, broken. It's broken on every character. Honestly, even though Charge Arm is really good, this combination just does so much damage. It's very, very silly. It's, it's an option. If you're not looking to do that, you could stick to your uh, potentially challenge rank or S rank items. So it really just depends on how far along you are in the endgame. For multi-hits, we mentioned Vivian briefly already. However, in the Ranger section, we did not mention the Daylight Scar. The Daylight Scar is just a really great follow-up weapon if you happen to demon a high defense target and you need it dead. Daylight Scar Berserk kills the target. Fortunately, you're a Ranger, so you have a lot more accuracy to land the special. So it not having like super high hit percentage is not a deal breaker like it might be on the Hunters. But be aware that, generally speaking, this is a ranged world. Unless you're doing very specific quests, you're not going to be using this for casual clear. Specific quests would include things like tower for clarity. <laughs> Pretty much anything involving tower. Uh, we already talked about all these items. I'm not going to go through them in detail. So the higher hit, you the higher hit better. So if you could get 30 hit plus. That's usually a pretty good threshold for when you switch over from being able to, like, power power special to power special special. So, when in doubt, just kind of pump this up. I'm gonna say new scene percentage, if full up. Only. I'm gonna say hit, hit optional. It, fall off. it can be useful to one-shot uh, some other enemies. Like, for example, if you have a hit percentage Galatine, you can Spirit delete uh, the Brands pretty quickly with a Ranger, which is pretty amusing. So being able to combo kill a Brands as a Ranger is a really good feeling. <laughs> Just want you to know. Like, Q-Cast, he could do that in his sleep. He's like, I have regular mech guns, I got this. Ramar, Ramar, they're like, I can hit you, but I can't kill you. Galatine is like the, I can definitely hit you because it is sniper accuracy. Teehee, I one-shot you. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's situationally useful. You might have stronger options depending on if you have uh, S ranks or if you have, uh, again, like really strong heaven strikers. So just be aware there's more than one option to deal with enemies. So then I just put utility with hit percentage. I'm going to say 30 hit plus. If you manage to get one of these, it's it's pretty much GG. You're pretty much never going to miss. I put Gearsol in here. I feel like Gearsol with... If you get Gearsol with hit, it's usually worth using. Or other percentages. I don't think like an all zeroed Gearsol from some of the other questers is useful for late game. 
So I'm going to briefly mention Snow Queen. We didn't talk about it when we were talking about Frozen Shooter earlier. So if you happen to get a very high hit percentage Frozen Shooter, in theory, you could change this over to Snow Queen. It's generally a more restrictive item. Basically, let me hide this so I can read. It still has infinite vertical range. It still uses the heavy power and accuracy, but it can't combo, which is definitely a shame. The trade-off, other than very minor differences in power, is that it can pierce targets. There's a couple of quests where I would say this would be really useful to have. I know, for example, Ramar and Ramarl really struggle to deal with character or er, enemies like Sinnohs and multiple Barans. So being able to have a piercing freeze is useful for them. Using it in high level areas, it's a mixed bag. Without the high accuracy, you're pretty much not going to hit a lot of things in Seabed or even like CCA and beyond. So that's why hit percentage is recommended there. It's still ridiculous. It's ridiculous trying to land these shots, even with hit percentage. But I will say from the standpoint, uh, casts don't really need this item. They have freeze traps. So as long as you have a freeze trap and you have potentially escape dolls to revive yourself, you have an AoE freeze that's more on demand and does not really require this. So I would say don't worry about this as much or at all as a cast. Ramar, if you're planning on running a lot of mines, maybe you'll consider picking this up, depending on what kind of runs you're doing. Because keep in mind, for rangers, they don't have a really good get-off-me option for Sinnohs and their hit-stun immune. So while Frozen Shooter can, like, single pick off one or two, they can't really deal with, like, four at once. Whereas casts don't care about that. They're like, teehee confuse trap or teehee freeze trap, and <laughs> they just kill them all. So otherwise, chat, uh, I think we went over all these items before. I'm not going to go into the big details. Trail Parasol, just a stronger charge partisan. Uh, we mentioned earlier the virus armor upgrade. It can be useful for surviving Sinnoh. I used it a lot on my Ramar. So anecdotally, this let me finally do mines runs as a uh, like below level 200 Ramar. Just because of the fact that not getting knocked down is so huge on a character with no debuff. Your mileage may vary for other characters. Be aware this can be expensive if you're looking to get it. And we talked about this item a few times and we'll talk about it again and again. We'll leave it partially off screen. I think at this point Chad knows all the stats on the item, but basically 20 to everything, decent defense, 30 to all the uh, fire, ice, thunder, resist, 5 to the other resist, not as great there. Technically also has HP and TP recovery, which is okay. But it's a very slow rate, so generally it doesn't really matter. Um, you want it for the same accuracy as Ranger Wall. I want, I want to state that again. You want this for the same accuracy bonus as Ranger Wall. The difference is that it just has better defensive stats, and it gives you ATP. So, endgame item through and through. Alternatively, since you are Ranger... Technically, you could get away with using Goofy Shields if you really don't care about the ATP bonuses. Like, if you're not going to be using uh, the combat gear from earlier, etc. Say alternatively, ATP shield in early areas only. Like that. Technically, this shield name is in quotes. This basically just provides you with free PB create. Having 40 to fire ice and thunder is actually pretty strong against things like Gertabulu and Falls, so it's not bad for surviving them as an alternative. So some people, or at least forces, will often shield swap. Rangers don't do it as much, but it is really funny swapping into something like this while having things like Adepton and just laughing as you take like literally like, like 400 total damage from Falls. You're like, nice try, Falls. You, you did your best. So another classic, we'll just keep it real short here. 15 to all major stats, 1.5 to attack, just a straight up upgrade on Heavenly Battle. Talked about Heavenly Arms and Adept. V502, just as a reminder, gives 100% hell bonus, otherwise 50% to Paralysis, Freeze, and Confuse. 
let's talk a little bit about their S ranks and finally what they spend points on. So now we're at the true, true end game of PD usage. When you have nothing better to do and you don't feel like running challenge mode. So generally speaking, demon mech guns, pretty strong. Gun rifle version of Zalor is not bad for casts. I'm gonna say non Ramara only. This actually. Technically, the raw mark can use this as well. And sadly, the, the raw mark cannot debuff. Um, otherwise, things like having like a Berserk Needle is pretty strong. Let me move this around slightly, actually. I'm gonna make it match how we talked about it in the other video. I'm gonna put them under Niche. Something like that. I do feel like demon mech guns are so universal that you should pretty much be training this between all of your classes. So getting this really early is super strong. Otherwise, your options are basically needle, hell needle, rest needle. Both of those basically mean that as a raw or raw moral, you have the ability to shut down every single group. And obviously being able to hell everything means that you can just shut down a lot of episode two. Alternatively, if you're sharing between classes, you might consider the Slicer or J-Cutter, since not all character classes can use options that the Rangers can. I would say under Niche, I guess I'll also move this here. Just to keep it a little more in line with our other guide, because I don't want to confuse players. I think these are pretty much like the core. You get some combination of Demon, Hell, and Arrest, and that is basically what you need to carry the game. The mech guns don't need you to have V502 in case you are burnt out of PDs. Otherwise, depending on if you're looking to focus Episode 2, Hell might be slightly more important. If you're looking to just generically shut down enemies, Arrest might be more important. So just be aware that it's... That's about the right priority order. Uh, the real thing you're going to be potentially spending PDs on, either trading for for spheres or trading for already geared slash sphered brands launchers. This gun is really, 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 really strong if you can sphere it. I think it's just okay compared to charge arm before then. It hits one less shot than charge arms do, so sometimes that can make your clears a little slower. The shots are also slower than the normal shotgun shots. So if enemies are like spinning in circles because they haven't found anybody, or the enemy in general moves somewhat fast, the shots will actually just straight up miss, which is a bit awkward. But against really stationary enemies or frozen enemies or enemies that kind of just kind of lumber along or super, super big, uh, Baran's launcher will end up basically deleting them. So whereas rangers might not be able to combo kill with charge arm on things like Sinnoh's normally, if you sphere it to cover whatever enemy type that you're fighting, it does start to lead to combo kills. So rule of, rule of thumb is if it has five enemies or more, or it has intervals of five, or like, yeah, intervals of five per group. So like five enemies, 10 enemies, 15 enemies. Usually I'll stick to something like charge arm. If it's only four, I'm going to consider Baran's launcher uh, if I'm playing with multiple people in a group, and they also happen to have like a lot of single target, I might even just charge Vulcan if the numbers are four or less. So keep in mind that even though you do have like crowd clear, you should be thinking about what the benefits and strengths of are of the other classes and characters that have joined you in multiplayer. So if I'm playing with a lot of rangers, I might stick to more shotguns since we're just looking to spread a lot of AoE damage. If I'm looking to play with Hunters, I might just stick to single target because they might kill their targets so quickly kind of thing. It's a judgment call. Finally, the only other, I would say, notable rare for Rangers would probably be Heaven Punisher. It, it allows you to basically pew pew laser prior to episode four. So for people that are playing on um, classic mode, for example, in Infinia, this is their only option to pew pew laser. So it definitely has more value on those kinds of restrictions. Otherwise, it does the same thing as Heaven Striker with the pew pew laser. The difference is that it doesn't require a mag to raise it and use it. 
So it gives you a bit more flexibility. So if you want an invincibility mag, if you're taking Heaven Punisher, for example, into Falls on Odd Beat, for, or what, it still has to be Even Beat, excuse me. If you take it into Falls in Even Beat or Episode 4 Even Beat, you could still take advantage of boss invincibility to make sure you clear a little faster. So it has its niche uses. Okay, chat, so we're winding down with the last kind of set of items for the Force. So Forces are really complicated because of the fact that they want to be using MST in some areas and ATP in some areas. So depending on if you're looking to focus mostly, let's say, solo episode 1, you might stick to MST and or uh, just clearing episode 4 in general, you'll probably be sticking to MST. But there are situations where you might want to consider an ATP build, in particular if it's an area that's really easy to clear with something like Disco Grave Man, which we talked about with some of the other classes. So, basically, the number one thing that you really need to climb with forces, MST tech levels. So in order to learn techs, you need MST in some amount in order to learn it. So I put together what I call the Learn Tech Starter Kit. So it's not really hard to get a Rappy Mag with 185 MST or more. Mark III Mags are another example that potentially you'd be more Mind Strength or Mental Strength. Heavenly Mind Times 4 is a fantastic amount of MST to kind of push you through the rest of the cap. Just show you in the corner real quick. So 45 MST times 4 is a nice 180 MST. So if a skill needs somewhere between 700 and, nine, and like 880 or so to learn, this is a very significant portion of your learning process. Alternatively, if you're still starting out, this is still a really great way of just doing massive amount of damage, and you save money on things like monofluids and difluids, and you make sure that you get more benefits from trifluid because you have more TP in the quest. Now, I recommend that there are a whole bunch of items you can wield in your main hand to learn things. I generally don't recommend holding onto a weapon unless it specifically grants a bonus to what you're using, but I find a really cheap pickup that potentially is available all year round, at least in trades here, is the Type DS Wand. The reason why I like to use this over a lot of the other options that exist, I think for example Broom is another example offhand that has like similar MST in case you want to have one that you could get on your own. The reason I like this one, the MST to use this is only 350 and 50 MST is insane. So overall you're adding almost 230 MST just between your units and your wand. Couple that with your Rappy Mag that's adding approximately I'm trying to do math while tired, let me think about it, about 370 on top of that. So you're already doing a ridiculous amount of work towards the minimum MST you need to use a technique. So th that combination of things alone will put you probably in the mid-20s for most techniques. In order to ensure that you can hit level 29 level techniques, you need to push yourself a little further, and you potentially need to get mine materials. So. You might need some mind materials, depending on what level offensive tech you're getting here. So just be aware, if you're getting closer to 29, you probably need to move mind materials a little higher on this list. If you're level 27, the difference of not needing like 100 some, hundreds or so MST is pretty different. Also, if this is a character that's already level 80, then the mind materials are about where they should be. So just keep in mind if you're looking to do like a level 1 rush, I would basically not play the character unless I had like 150 mind materials or if I'm Faux Newman I might go 140 mind and 10 luck for example in order to learn everything. So pick one, it really just depends on where you are with the characters to the priority. Now the other thing you want to make sure that you have are all the support techniques. So Shifta, D-Band, Delore, Delon. If you have those... Actually, I don't even see if multi... Well, I guess that's fine. I just moved it down in priority. That's fair. So, these things only really scale if you're playing multiplayer for the most part. So, like, an early force going MST build doesn't really benefit from Shifta. They benefit a little bit from D-Band, but most of the time their armor and shield are kind of terrible and their base defense is kind of terrible. 
Gentleman might make some difference. It depends on where you are, but ideally you don't need to do it. I guess I'll make a, a, denote, a denote here, or a small note, excuse me. Jelen is worth, I think, getting a little early over the other ones, just because surviving enemies is more important sometimes than being able to buff your own defense. So if you're in harder areas, let's say you're going to like the underground uh, desert area in episode 4, you don't necessarily need shift to D-ban, but you at least need to be able to gel in some things like the Goron Detonator, if that makes sense. And that's applicable whether you're in single player or not. In particular, if you're playing the phone neural, she has like no stats at all. So ensuring you don't accidentally get crit killed by enemies, it's kind of important to have Jell in there. Otherwise, you could delay it for a bit later. Now I recommend, I would recommend uh, hunting for these, but if for whatever reason you're just looking for a quick pickup and you're just looking to get like a starter kit going, you have the common tech boost weapons for the different elements. So Fire Scepter, Agni, Ice Staff Dragon, or, no, it's not Dragon, it should be Dagon. And Storm One Indra. I'll give 20% towards all techs of their elements. So fire, this fire techs like Foey, Ice is like Rivarda, etc. So you want all three of these, you're gonna be rotating out um, pretty much throughout your clears. Generally speaking, males can get away with unarmed casting. Make a note here. Make a little note there for people that may or may not have seen the other guides. So generally females, you're going to be holding one of these at all times. You're going to be swapping mid-combat, mid- Potentially mid-wave, but at least between waves, uh, whatever is most optimal for the situation. Now, one thing that I like to do is, I, for the other characters, it's more of a quality of life. I think for forces, it's kind of mandatory. At some point, you need a heavenly HP, and if you're if you're a phone neural, you need as much help as you get. You might as well as get two. So this just offers you 100 HP or 200 HP if you have two of them for the phone neural. So the intent behind this is that. There's a lot of set damage in the game. Some set, set damage gets as high as about 80 or 880 or so. It's, it, I would say probably the most common set damage you would see from a force if you're doing episode 4. Which is a lot of health, especially for Foe Neural, who might only have like 500 or 600 health, depending on what your HP materials are coming into ultimate. So being able to survive even basic things like a dwarf on charge at 700, might not actually be achievable if you haven't been collecting a lot of HP materials. So I will stress that this is probably one of the most worn units on the force until you get to higher level. For Fonu Roll, sadly, she's pretty much wearing it the whole time. Wreck that spelling. It's gonna tell me I spelled it wrong. I'm like, no, 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 no. I know it's new where L. <laughs> That's how I learned how to spell it in my head. Let's gotta make sure I put it there. Otherwise, uh, from that point forward. Actually, I'm gonna move this slightly. I'm gonna move God Technique up. The reason why I think this is important is that I think for one PD's worth, because God Techniques are pretty cheap. God Technique would allow your 27 to 29 offensive techniques to basically gain the equivalency of like 40 to 50 more damage, depending on how underlevel they are, and it also buffs your other techniques, like uh, Grants or potentially Megid, which for Megid you might use it full time depending on what you're doing, but that's a side note. So I think getting that before maxing my materials is probably for the best. So this is a very cheap pickup, because one PD's worth of mine materials I don't think is greater than God Technique, so I think I'm going to leave it in that order. But basically, the ability to treat your uh, techniques as three level higher than what they are. Sadly, they do not go over the cap of uh, the force, which I don't think I talked about technically before. I'm just double checking something. One moment. Oh, never mind. There is no A. Right, Murphy. I'm going to have to change that. I think I did that by accident in the other guide. Oh well. But anyway, from the standpoint of the techniques, 
If you haven't already gotten them yet, I would probably just get all the level 30 techniques. Then there's a whole other category which we're going to talk about at some point, which are the elemental merges. So I would recommend you get at least one elemental merge. It's basically their equivalency of a shield. I think this is such high priority that honestly, I might even move it higher on this list. But honestly, most of these are just core start to finish. If you take these, you can handle basically anything throughout the different episodes. I'm not sure if I would... I guess I'll take the chat opinion on this. Would you think an elemental merge is more important to get or V801 early on? I might move V801 up one, actually. I think for... I think for females it's important to get the fast cast before the elemental merge. That way you could get the stun locks. But I do think that you should get this at some point before you even consider mid-game or anything else. Maybe that's correct. Then as like a quality of life, adepts. Adepts reduce your TP costs. Honestly, if you're going to be playing full-time force, there's no reason to not get at least one adept, preferably two. Especially since Newman accuracy is so bad in terms of per level. If you're looking to run any kind of support items, kind of there, making my bot, welcome Nate. So I think from that standpoint. Oh, you're making the bot following? Thank you, thank you, Nate. But essentially, from that standpoint, this should cover basically everything you need. Horses don't have a lot of crazy items. Like, sadly, most of these are also considered endgame. Like, there's really not too much else to add from the MST perspective. We'll talk about some Uber drops. You're Thank you for the open. follow name. But, uh, this will carry you basically to level 200. I'm not joking. Like, this... They need so much less than some of the other characters. Like, it seems like a lot to get all the techniques, but then, like... The, the rate at which you can learn them and the rate at which you can use them is so much earlier, so they kind of hit their endgame before the other characters. But sadly, their endgame damage potential is much lower as well. Well, it's kind of the trade-off, I suppose. ATP is a bit odd, so what I would say is... You could basically get almost any power mag combo. You could go for the standard 145 ATP. Technically, they're okay with 140. I recommend one Heavenly Power if you're looking to wield something like an Excalibur earlier. So, sadly, because they have such high base ATP requirements, you're not really going to go full into an ATP build until roughly the mid-game, but for some characters you might find it easier to level with them. So I do mention, for example, things like 13, which is an ability to buff the accuracy of Disco Rayman and also increase its damage, so we'll pop it up here just as a quick reminder for the chat. Uh, but basically, this combination of armor, which is only 101 to use, with Disco Rayman is super good. I will denote, though, for Fomarls in particular, they do not like to go MST for the most part when you hit the mid game with them. And mid game for them is like about like 110 ish. So about the time they can use 13. The reason being is the Fomoral Slicer animation is so good that it basically just cleaves up everything. Yeah. Murphy's saying it's a coin toss. Yeah, I, I could see arguments for either. I think Fiat 1 has slightly more uses. I would say if you had two elemental merges, I would weigh them over in Fiat 1, but with just only one elemental merge, I'd just put it lower. I think having a full selection of them is more important than Fiat 1, if that makes sense. It's one of those ones where it's, it's so... It's complicated to get it in, like, a specific order. I, I went back and forth on this list several times. But anyway, we digress briefly. So Disco Brave Man getting the ATP bonus with the Fomarl Slicer animation is ludicrous. And I think the Fomarl's ATP is also surprisingly good. It's just his accuracy is terrible. So for both the Fomarl and the Fomarl, even if you do the accuracy glitch of using the special attack and then a normal attack right before the special hits in order to take advantage of that accuracy, of the second hit, I do think they still need a pretty high base hit percentage. So I would not go lower than 25 on early areas. I would honestly recommend probably closer to 40 plus on forces. They need as much help as they can get, and they can pump out the damage. I think people don't realize or don't think about it from that perspective. Like, yes, their ATP is low, but if you're playing single player and you have access to Zalor and Shifta, their damage is so insane on group clear. 
you would be very surprised how good they are at ATP clear, especially in single player. Multiplayer, it's a little iffy because that evasion difference between enemies in single and multi really, really devastates the, the weaker people. Yeah, level 30 Zalore is absolutely bonkers. So I think people kind of sleep on that, and I do recommend for people that are even vaguely curious about this to try it out, as it is an extremely effective strategy to the point that it is meta on several characters. Um, I think from the perspective of the other weapons... You can use Vulcans and Vice... I'm gonna say needs higher hit percentage for multi. They're actually fine with it in single player, and you can just treat them like every other single target damage character with the Fomar and Fomarl, since their ATB is good enough. But I think just the hit percentage just makes it not good enough, sadly. So I'll make I'll make note of that. I, I think people don't even think of using Vulcans. I I basically only on stream use it on single player, which is almost never. I almost never play single player force on stream. I usually play multiplayer force all the time though. But from that perspective, it can be very good. It's just that they really they really, really, really need that accuracy to make it worth it. So while they can Zalore things to make sure that their uh, charge hits do a lot of damage, they do have a big issue with accuracy. One thing that they can also kind of get into, which is very amusing for melee clears, if you can get a gear assault with some combination of enemy attribute and hit percentage, 50 accuracy on a gear assault is actually not bad. Mech guns, for example, only have 35, so it's pretty much like getting a 15 hit mech gun for free equivalency. But the base damage on the gear assault is pretty good. So if you're looking to just kind of cleave through enemies, if you're looking to potentially have a weapon to deal with enemies that have insane resistances, like Darkbringer having 90 ice resist for no reason to multiplayer in episode 1, um, which is my favorite example, by the way, to bring up. I bring it up all the time. But from that standpoint, that gear assault is just so good. Not saying my accuracy can't fall more with charts still needs to do normal heavy heavy to always hit overflow. Yeah, it's pretty much like until you have Red Ring, and if you're doing like multiplayer in particular, it's a little less optimal. Once you get things that boost your accuracy, like the Red Ring Shield mentioned by Murphy, your life as a melee force goes through the roof. So where I, I feel like from like levels 80 to let's say about, let's say realistically probably close to 160, I do feel like MST has just a, a much easier time because they basically hit their cap. But then once the ATP starts catching up through raw levels, and then especially at 180 is a big power spike for those forces. Uh, man, does it hit for a lot of damage. Do not sleep on Girasol, that item is fantastic. Speaking of fantastic, there's not a lot of, like, artisan weapons. I guess in theory I could have brought this up with the other characters, but I don't think it's worth trading for this specifically over the other options that people have. Uh, Fomar is able to use this Partisan. It has an 800 ATP minimum requirement. Sadly, it is a male-only weapon. It does decent damage. It gives you a little 50 extra defense, which helps if you're trying to emulate a hunter or face tanking for the party. It's not bad. I think, though, Fomar has so many specific items. They're worth kind of calling out item for item here. So let's go to Rambling May. Also, Foe Newman can use Girasol to decent effect. Sadly, his ATP is not anywhere as good as the Fomar's. So for Fomar, you want more accuracy. Foe Newman, you want um, more just enemy attributes, comparatively. But from the standpoint of Rambling May, this is pretty much Fomar only. This is her bread and butter. If you could get this with dark and hit percentage, you basically have your boss kill weapon. The fact that it's a pistol range shotgun animation sounds bad because most of the time shotgun animation is really 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 slow on fomar although for some reason it shoots faster than a pistol so it only hits one target but one target will get hit twice so your normal heavy heavy because you never use the special for the you i've never seen people use the special for this let me clarify people use this purely for the atp so they do normal heavy heavy on any given target, and she can combo kill. 
which is crazy. The Fomoral being able to combo kill stuff as a force, especially in single player, is bonkers. I can't understate how powerful this gun is for her, and what a big difference it is playing MST versus ATP. This is just one of those weapons that does everything. Infinite vertical height, double hits, fantastic scaling with hit percentage, fantastic scaling with uh, enemy attributes. Technically, if you're really, really into it and you just want to live the rambling May life, there's a more expensive shield option we'll talk about later for ATP, but I'll mention it here. Uh, that gives you an extra 30 accuracy prior to getting something like Red Ring, which is pretty much ridiculous. Rambling May is pretty much the reason to play Fomarl. It's one of them. Her slicer animation is really broken, so I feel like people sleep on how dumb she is with, like, s rank Slicers or Slicer Fanatic or Disco Brave Man. Like, honestly, I feel like she completely outdamages the Rangers with the same items, just because her animations are so much cleaner and so much shorter compared to the others. Like, she just gets an, a straight-up extra hit over other characters. It's kind of hard to compete with somebody that's getting extra hits. On top of that, her animation keeps her really, like, stationary. Like, she moves enough to maybe dodge hits, but she isn't, like, leaping forward like an idiot like some of the other characters do, which makes it, like, basically unusable to use after, like, a three-hit combo for most characters. Fomarl goes, like, slice, slice, slice. <laughs> like, you, you've done big damage to people. Sadly, without really high enemy percentages, you're not really gonna one-shot with Disco Brave Man. Whereas Rambling May, single player, you're probably gonna one-shot a decent amount of things if there's a Lord. And it, as I said before, it's a fantastic boss option. Fomarl's entire combo moves as much as you guys one slicer attack, yeah, pretty much. Uh, also for Fomarl, another really great pickup for her. We mentioned this item a ton of times. That should tell you how good this item is. The base damage of this 590, on top of her having a really fast animation, kind of like the Huka Seal, uh, means that she's able to just kind of decimate everything. Like, these two, basically, any Slicer, Vivian, Rambling May, you're set for life. Once you start getting more ATP, I feel like things like Last Swan on the Fomoral are more useful. This is more kind of like a mid-game pickup. I would almost argue this is end-game pickup because of how much it relies on your raw stats. But in theory, if you're playing more ATP materials, or you're playing, uh... Instead of going for, like, raw... Actually, I guess I never really talked about materials in here. I guess I should mention them at some point. If you're going for, like, max class stuff, then maybe it's okay? I'm gonna make a note here. I'm gonna say consider. Let's see, where do I want this? It's after the mag. Probably, probably after Disca. Less and max stats. Or generic power slash luck. Field item sooner. do something like that. Let's just make a note here. I think, for example, the mag and heavenly power plus the disca is maybe a little more important than just getting power materials right away. But it is important to have those if you want to use Excalibur slash Galatine. Luckily, he says it might also be worth adding to the phone world list. She can use all the phone world stuff, just less effective, but she's better at health. Um, yeah, I guess I can. I, I usually just don't prefer to do that. Less, I'll put less preferred. How's that? <laughs> I feel like between Rambling May, Vivian, Last One, Soul Banish. She, she doesn't really benefit from this, in general. Soul Banish, I'm not sure if she can use, actually. Let's go find out in real time. If yeah, she can't use this. Do something like this. Split the category slightly. So, you have a couple Partisan options.
think Tyrell's Parasol is also okay for the most part. Let's compare these two since they're both just partisans. You have 350, there's 370 for base weapon damage. Otherwise, if you're trying to land combos with this, I'm gonna say needs... Honestly, 40 hit plus. They, they kind of need it. So think about which one is worth it. Soul Banish doesn't need as much, fortunately, because you're not looking to land the special. It also naturally comes with 5 more accuracy. It's okay. It's just an option for you to hit AoE. I'd still prefer to use whenever I can Vivian or Rambling May and just go all the way through. But if you're playing single player, it does come up somewhat often that you need to be able to clear multiple enemies. When you're playing with the full group, you only need to focus on maybe two or three enemies at a time, tops. Since your party should be able to split targets, for example. So just be aware of that. Th these are options. I, I still really prefer Rambling May Vivian, sometimes less Swan of high level, slash I've done like the all our material route with them. So let's talk about things that are kind of shared between the different characters. We're gonna call them the supports and adds on the, the support and add-ons. So basically if you're looking to land any kind of special or any kind of ATP. You're going to need Heavenly Arms and or Adepts. You might have an Adept already if you're playing MST. And you need a Smart Link. So Adepts, we already mentioned, reduce TP cost. Fantastic item, gives bonuses to resistances. Smart Link just reduces the range penalty. So I'll briefly show this, because I don't think I showed this earlier. So if you're playing with like the Rambling May, which has a range of 170 for Fomoro in particular, a minus 56 penalty at max distance feels pretty bad. And Slicer Fanatic is a really common pickup for characters, so if you want to be able to be throwing this thing, which Fomoral is fantastic at using in episode 2, by the way, with the glitch of uh, the, the special normal stuff, really, really recommend you pick up some accuracy. But these are things I don't think you're going to get until you're either fully committed into ATP, or if you're going MST, you might delay it until like 140, 150, when your natural stats start to catch up a little bit. Just be aware, it really just depends on where you're looking to farm, quote unquote, in PSO Ultimate, or what kind of content you're looking to do. But in either case, if you're looking to do some big damage here, once you have some of these items... I don't think I mentioned this. that up there. So from that perspective, if you go through and you have your heavenly battle from before, Slicer Fanatic is a three target demons. I pretty much use this on Fomoral 24-7. Otherwise, you don't have a lot of other demon options. You have Demon Ray Gun and Bringer's Arm. Bringer's Arm is just a sniper range version of doing demons. The wall the Ray Gun has okay accuracy. The Bringer's Arm, which we'll go to in a moment, excuse me, the Bringer's Rifle. Just has a lot of raw ATP, which is not bad for most characters. They could do okay damage with it if you're looking to poke and finish off the demon targets, which cannot be said with Ray Gun, because they barely do damage with Ray Gun. Um, but the fact that it's a sniper range of 210 is really, really solid. So at some point, you should really consider upgrading to Bringer's Rifle, because it is the equivalency, I think we said, of a 63-ish ray gun. Can compare again in a moment. Oh, even better. So, this one is 63, so you would pump it up to 113. So it would be the equivalency of... 78 accuracy ray gun? If I'm doing math correctly. It's a pretty big difference. I make a bringer's uh, 50 hit equi equivalency to that. And as you play the higher areas, like your towers, your seabeds, your... Maybe, maybe Goron detonators or Gerda Bulus to some extent in episode 4. As much accuracy as you can get, grab it. Because forces really struggle to hit things without super boosted items. This is one of the few options, if you get a bringer's right arm and you create it yourself and you're willing to spend some photon crystals, 
you might be able to save some PDs, but otherwise this is pretty much a staple in every single force. Honestly, there's a no, there's no reason to not bring it in every single quest, just because of the fact that sometimes you just can't combo kill, and demons into like a normal heavy heavy will probably be good enough to kill most targets anyway. So just consider from that standpoint, it's pretty strong for them. <laughs> I've thought about at one point if I ever wanted to sphere a bringer's rifle for them. They need all the help they could get, chat. I've thought about it. <laughs> I'm not going to do that over some of their other options, but man, chat. The thought of just being able to combo kill afterwards is just... Mm. So we mentioned Terrell's Parasol as a damage item. It also gives a bonus to Shifta, Resta, and... Uh, D-band in terms of range. Blind Divine is the debuff version of this. Help says forget the hit percentage need compared to BR, but if it has 80 plus for heat, like ray gun, you'll have almost forever 50 hit. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's much easier to get that 50 hit breaker's rifle than it is to get like a 70 hit plus ray gun for sure. Fully agree with that. But for Glide Divine, this one has some niche utility outside of boosting the debuff range. It provides 15 to all resistances. If for some reason you haven't... I can't think of anything offhand where you wouldn't already be able to... If you have 900 base, I think with any basic weapon you should be able to learn all techniques in the game. But if for whatever reason you are lacking a unit or something weird, I guess the 55 MST is useful. If you truly just want to learn like level 30 grants or something, or <laughs> something something outrageous maybe this will make a difference to you for how quick you learn that technique otherwise like it can be held i'll just close this briefly so check and read it it can be held in your hand for how many minutes 10 minutes in order to fully restore your tp this comes up every rare once in a while but again the ability to have the boosted resistances is useful for surviving uh, annoyingly high damage from things like Epsilon, where you need as much help as you can get to survive the 1400 plus fire damage from that target, or potentially just surviving a room of lilies where your damage is not really important at all, in like a fast clear run, or if you're just looking to survive a Gurdabulu because you're the, the bait for the rest of the people doing the actual work, maybe you'll equip this over some of the other options. But as a reminder, even if you're playing a support course, Please be prepared to do damage, whether it's through MST or through weapons. Like, you are you are really missing out in your potential, especially in places like Episode 4, of just how useful it is for you to stack the Poe over it is for you to hold a Glide Divine and just focus on, like, simple Jelens or something like that. You're, you're missing out on the true potential in some areas if you don't do a mixture. But anyway, chat, let's talk about some of the armor options. So most of these are basically the same. They have the same level requirement. The big difference between these uh, different cloaks is just the fact that Ignition Cloak is 10% to all fire techniques, which is a pretty common thing for Episode 4 and is the preference. Vengeal Cloak, again, level 99, gives 10% to all ice techniques. Tempest Cloak... Again, level 99 to use is 10% to all lightning techniques. So depending on what area I'm running, or if it's single player or multiplayer, I will swap things out. So for example, Ignition Cloak is pretty much the go-to for Episode 4, and all be all, it is the best one, uncontested. Congeal Cloak, it depends. Episode 1 multiplayer, Ice does okay. A lot of things that are weak to lightning tend to have an element swap there. If I'm playing single player Episode 1, I prefer Tempest Cloak. Just because if I'm doing a mix of forest and caves, both of both of them have a lot of big weaknesses to lightning, and it stunlocks rooms, and it hits like really annoying spawns like lilies and a spawn of like 14 or so in a room, where something like Robardo won't reach in multiplayer, even though it's their weakness, but Razan will. It also technically helps with some of the bosses, like I'll use Gazan, for example, on Dragon if I'm doing like a Terrell's Ego or something like that. And sometimes that little elemental boost does help with making sure you kill the boss fast enough. Otherwise, if you're just looking to survive certain runs, Brightness Circle is okay for defense. Arguably, I sometimes use this on the phone roll because I care a little less about having 10% bonus damage 
over just surviving a hit in episode 4, like underground in particular. So, kind of weigh your options for what makes sense for your thresholds. Speaking of Lily runs, females only have 25 EDK options to survive Lily rooms, but males get 70 EDK from Dressplate. I do think forces worry about this a little less than the other classes, just because things like Razan do stun lock pretty well. So keep that in mind that these are probably not as high priority as they are in like a Hunter or Ranger comparatively. Now I think there's two armors that I like to use when I'm unsealing, like this. So, generally speaking, forces will go back to normal mode at some point in order to unlock weapons once you've acquired them on your own. So, if it's for, so for example, you might get lame to Argent in Episode 4 and you need you know, 10k plus kills or whatever in order to unlock Excalibur. So, generally speaking, this is done with forces because they're able to spam Gafoe. So, even though Ignition Cloak does boost fire damage, if you're playing on normal mode, that generally doesn't matter, that 10%. It's better for you to just not run out of TP, so you can kind of autopilot it better. So in those scenarios, you can consider Mother Garb or Mother Garb Plus. The big differences between these two are extremely minor elemental resistance and defense slash evasion differences. More importantly, the grants bonus goes from 10% randomly to 30% randomly, which can help if you're clearing episode 4 and you're looking to target stuff like Gurdabulu. So, it has its use in other areas, it is technically good in most scenarios. But just be aware that it is probably the preferred armor, especially as you get higher level, if you're going to unseal. The ability to not have to use a tri-fluid in a run is kind of huge. So, it just depends on if you're doing something like House Clock Challenge versus uh, Beyond the Horizon in Episode 4 as to which armor, Ignition Cloak, or Mother Guard might end up being more useful for you. Finally, in terms of armor... Oh, I guess I could put under this niche. Let me, let me put one more niche use. I could put in the Cursed Cloak. So, for characters that are not the faux new role, if you're playing early on, and you need Piercing Megid, so for example, you're playing a lot of Episode 2 with friends where your tech damage doesn't matter at all. The only thing that matters is probably Piercing Megid. Most of the time, you're just not going to have enough accuracy to hit a lot of the old Gibbons. Unless you have like something insane in your main hand and you have Red Ring. Because they really struggle to hit special attacks against most of those enemies. So I think for a majority of the mid-game, until you get to very high level, Cursed Cloak ends up being pretty useful so that you can actually clear places like Temple and Spaceship with Megan Spam. You also have the benefit of having higher uh, health percentage than most characters if, with God Technique, you could force this to be level 30. So there are some enemies that might have total immunity to people with V502 but not immunity to you. If other players are not using V502 and they're only using V501, you'll basically be on par with them, but V502 will outshine you completely. And if that doesn't make sense to you, just be aware that Megid is good until you get endgame units. It's the easiest summarization of that. So, I think that covers basically all the options, except for one for the phone neural. So, their big thing is that they have a lot of trouble dealing damage to Volt Op. The one thing that's kind of sad for uh, Vault Op in general is that it really depends on your ability to have really high ATP. And Phone Rural ATP is garbage. <laughs> it is bad. She's going to be leveling like 1 ATP on most level ups, even in the late game. So you need something to like really greatly compensate her completely atrocious uh, ATP per level and her cap. So people will purposely get a Crimson Coat, and they'll wield a weapon called the Red Saber. Now ideally the Red Saber will come with Machine Percentage, the hit percentage does not matter on this item. The reason being is that the boss only really takes damage based off your ATP. So if, if I hit the monitors where I could see the boss with Gazond, yes I will damage the monitors, but it's going to check my ATP. So most characters other than her will wield an Excalibur. She specifically needs Crimson Coat plus Red Saber to do anything with this. So if you're looking to fight Vault Op and you're looking to do a lot of TTF, 
you will probably need this sooner rather than later. If you're not ever planning to do Vault Op and you're planning on doing other runs with her, let's say you're doing Episode 4 predominantly or you're just playing a support horse in Episode 2, um, then this is more skippable. So I talked about this briefly earlier, but there's the Elemental Merges. There are a lot. There's basically one per technique. But what I would say in general, the Foe Merge probably has the most overall utility, followed by Rough Foe Merge. Both of them are useful for spam casting. Notice they have extraordinarily low level requirements, so you could use these even while you're leveling to ultimate. Rebarda Merge is more useful, as I said before, in multiplayer, where ice resistances are high. If you're looking for a general survival, shield to put on, and you want something that's generically good, and you want something that's also just really good in episode 1 in general, I'm going to point out a special thing for 3 seals. One, it gives 33 to all resistances, so you're probably going to have enough EDK to maybe survive if you mess up on lilies with uh, some of your other armor options. So you already have much better options than some of the rangers and hunters do, uh, that are female, to deal with this. Uh, but more importantly, it also randomly negates uh, attacks against you. So while it does drain your health very slowly, the ability to just randomly negate damage as like a faux new roll is kind of insane. And sometimes people will just leave this on 24-7 because it is just so generically good against so many different enemies, against so many different bosses, and it potentially deals with problem enemies by giving you a second chance because you ignore their attack altogether. So I want to give a special shout out for that. It's not the best for clears unless you're talking about maybe forests and caves in episode 1. But, it is really, really strong if you're really not sure what else to use. Similarly, if you're playing more single player only, maybe you'll consider picking up a Gazan merge. The reason being that uh, flying enemies can be multi-struck by this ability. So for example, uh, the dragon bosses in episode 1 and 2 uh, can be chain hit with uh, Gazan, even though it's not their weakness per se. Because of the fact it can hit more than one target on the boss, it ends up doing more than the boss's actual weakness, in particular in multiplayer, so keep that in mind. I do think for Faux Neural specifically, she benefits from Barda Merge. There are a lot of enemies that are extremely weak to ice in single player, but are not really weak to them at all in multiplayer, even though it is quote unquote their weakness. So by having something like a Barda Merge in Ruins in particular, or even to some extent Episode 4 versus the Zoos, you can end up 3 to 4 spell killing, like, normally really tanky enemies, which to me is really funny, because they'll often die faster than some of the other waves will for you, if you have this merge. So again, a bit more situational than the others, that's why I put it later in the list, but it is really, really, really good in single player, I can't understate that. Now technically, if you just wanted raw ATP, and you were just going your ATP build, in theory you could wear combat gear. If you're feeling really confident you're never going to get hit by anything, by all means. Be aware it has literally no other defensive stats. Similarly, if you're playing uh, mostly an ATP build, let's say you're even playing a support role in Episode 2 where you're mostly focusing on Demons or maybe Slicer, your shield matters a little less as you level to 180, so you could probably get away with an anti-dark ring just to get like near immunity to everything. Otherwise, in terms of merges, the only other one I can think of that people sometimes use would be Breast Emerge. The females, the Fomoral and the Fonoral specifically, have the ability to basically heal really, really, really far away, so they don't need the range boost. It's more making sure that if you're in quests that have a lot of split paths, uh, that you're able to hit your party members in those scenarios. Otherwise, if you're all sticking together, room for room, it's not really a huge benefit to having this item. So we're almost done with the guide chat. We're gonna go through the things you could get in order to deal with bosses. So first and foremost, Excalibur. It's gonna keep coming up time and time again in this guide. It is just universally a really, really good item in order to deal with bosses. You can even be used as a beat stick for... Um, Darkbringers and things like that in multiplayer, where your ice damage doesn't do anything to them. 
you mentioned earlier, Red Saber, we're just listing it here, just so you don't forget it, in case you overlook it later, earlier in the list. And technically, Galatine can be substituted in, so I think we looked at Excalibur briefly with its requirements, and we'll compare them briefly here as well. But basically, only the Fomar and the Fomar can use it because of the minimum ATP requirement. It is a much stronger single-target weapon, but the trade-off is that the Excalibur is able to hit three targets, which is somewhat more useful in things like the Worm Boss. Just be aware of that. <laughs> I love that I said basically the Faux no no World should not do this. I do not believe the Faux no World should ever use Vices. I have never seen her do any real damage with them. It's just, it, she, she in theory could use it. I just don't think you'll, even with Zalore, the damage is terrible. She's a character that really depends on the base damage of a gun and, and or the specials of the weapon in order to do well. So let's talk about the different bosses before we uh, basically get to the final section. So from that standpoint, we have the Dragon Boss. I recommend having your Tempest Cloak, your Storm One Indras, and potentially your generic Beat Stick if you're playing ATP in order to deal with the Dragon. If the boss takes flight, lightning is always a good backup, so just keep in mind if you can't combo kill as you're leveling, just make sure to bring that with you. Worm boss, just Excalibur if able, otherwise Gazond I think is okay. Chat can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's Gazond for multiplayer. Basically, you should be using ATP whenever you're able to. I have not done it in so long because it is just so much more efficient to ATP, but honestly, it's so good. So good, chat. I guess I could say or Terrell's. Well. Whatever. Equivalency, though. I'll, I'll say or Partisan with it. Basically, you want to multi target this if you can. That'll leave it generic enough. Uh, Vault Up, sadly, you just need a generic beast sick. Yeah, it is Gazanda Nold. Okay, I had to think about that. I'm like, I think that's correct. <laughs> But again, it, it's been so long. I mean, that would have been like the first time I used a force in Ultimate. Think about how long ago that was, chat. That was like seven years. I mean, that was that was when uh, my main force was still leveling. That's crazy. Fuck tutorial. Hope you're doing well. Anyway, we got sidetracked a little bit. Um, otherwise, one exception to the beat stick rule are the angry fists. So males cast faster without weapons in their hands. So we like to joke on stream that the male's best weapon is to just unequip everything for rapid casting. But this is an option that you can boost your ATP while doing unarmed casts. So it's, a, it's an option to consider if you're having trouble with uh, the stun locks, or just looking for a lower ATP requirement to stun lock. Uh, things like Bolt Up, because 800 ATP is a really big ask if you're not going with power materials for forces. That's going to be like your 140 to like 170 range, depending on your character. Which can be a very long time, especially if you're looking to do a lot of TTF. Uh, so I think for the most part, I just kind of write some very basic boss notes, but basically if you have anything that boosts simple techs, it's probably good to use these here. So you're fine enough using the 20% boosts, but I believe I talk about a little later something, yeah, I talk about it a little later, something called Summit Moon. Might as well as mention it here. So Summit Moon is preferred over the 20% to all techniques for Falls specifically, just because this gives a 30% to Foey, Zond, and Barda. So it is a little weaker than the other club variants, so I'm going to leave it to the discretion of the people trading whether they want the 40% bonus, but they now have to micromanage three different clubs in their inventory, which is a total mess. Whether it's the Zumiri or the Mace of Adamant. Honestly, the only one that I use is Mace of Adamant. I'm going to be honest with you. And that's on Phone New World specifically, just so I could do like the 100% part of bonus damage. Uh, but otherwise, Summit Moon's kind of an all in one. I would say this is more core on Phone New World. It's not bad on the other forces. If I'm playing Falls solo, I'm going to have this. Anyway, it's not as high priority for sure. That's why I put it under situational later on. But otherwise, it's just kind of like... Most of the time, outside of like Episode 1, Episode 2 is going to require you to basically be ATP. 
playing playing tech damage against episode two bosses is miserable. Please don't do that. Multiplayer Olga flow. I think you could do like what chat. What 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 would you estimate from experience? Is it is it about ninety damage on a Grants on Olga flow's twenty thousand health? It's not worth it, chat. I'm put it that way. It's just it's not even remotely worth it to do on those kinds of bosses. I think in single player, maybe you could argue that. Uh, all the Barda buffs are worth it against Griffin. Griffin, I could kind of see it, but I, I just rather ATP like every single time. I mean, I guess if I just really can't do anything else, I'll Barda, but I'm going to be doing something else when the boss lands every other time. Griffin, okay to Barda. Ball in the air. So I'll explicitly put that in there. Otherwise, for episode 4, you're going to be sticking to a lot of Rezond and Rebarda uses. I'm going to put Spinners. Olga's Flow's weakness is ice for what it's worth. <laughs> In multiplayer, Olga's Flow's weakness is Teehee, you're a force die. <laughs> You're, you're not doing anything to Olga Flow. You should not tech that boss. That is a miserable experience. So I like to bring in Foey for the spinners specifically uh, to deal with the first phase of either Chamberdain, St. Million, or Conjury in Episode 4. I think otherwise, you Chamberdain, you should be building all Razan boosts. So hey, if you had three seal, what an excellent time to wear that. Otherwise, if you're St. Million and Conjure, you're going to be spamming Rabarda the most. So... Just bring whatever equivalency there is for those bonuses. We talked about all those items one by one. I'm not going back through them all. So let's talk about very minor optimizations. So there is an AoE option that you can get that is sometimes useful if you're late game. So we're going to put this under situational. It's a sword that hits 10 targets. Has a grind of 125, which is very crazy. And typically you can get this as part of an Affinia event. So it'll always come with hit percentage. I believe it's 30 hit offhand. So this potentially is useful to clear normal trash mobs in single player. So I'm gonna put this under here as situational. So it is universal across all the characters. It's not bad. One thing that I've been, I guess I've been a little too harsh on, I kind of ignored it in our other guides. And I'll, I'll probably update the guides retroactively. Sorcerer's Wand, or Sorcerer's Cane, excuse me. I think this is actually okay to bring with you. So the reason being is if you're looking to optimize unsealing, and you're just really looking to reduce how much TP you're using, the bonuses to Gafoe, Nizand, and Gabarda are actually not bad. And arguably, it's not even that bad in Episode 4, just from the standpoint that you're going to be Gafoe spamming like 80% of the time. I still think I prefer Fire Scepter, because I do like to Gafoe some rooms. But if you're alternating a lot, or you don't like the rapid switching of weapons, Gazond is pretty good against Goron Detonator when you're playing solo. So I think from that perspective, it is useful to potentially reduce how many weapons you have. There's a stronger version of this item, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but well, we'll talk about it now since we can compare it. There's a very expensive version called Magical Piece which gives a 30% bonus to everything. The downside is this costs a lot of PDs. So if you got it, you got it. It's nice to have. I don't recommend rushing a magical piece over whatever else we talked about, just because it is so many PDs. But getting a Sorcerer Cane is kind of like a budget version of it, I guess. So I guess I should be a bit more fair to this item. Anyway, back to the list. So, yeah, we talked about Sorcerer's Cane. We talked about one of these items. I think we talked about Safety Heart earlier. I'm just going to briefly pop that back up. Wow, chat, we ran out of music between the streams. Let me reset. Hold on. All the way back to the top. So, we mentioned before Safety Heart gives a bonus to Rambling May. It also gives bonus, or, or yeah. It gives bonuses to Rambling May, which is decent. We mentioned before that's kind of an expensive option. Let's take it one step further and mention one more time about Sweetheart. So having an attack multiplier for this armor is actually kind of good with Fomarl. 
So honestly, Chad, if you're playing ATP Fomarl, I'm not gonna call this like 100% required, but man. Man, oh man, is this kind of strong on her with Rambling May. Just even standing near one other character as you Rambling May spam is the difference between combo killing or not. 15% of your ATP is kind of huge. So it's just something to think about for sure. Downside is you lose defense, but whatever. When you're Fomarl, you ha you have Jelen on targets and you have uh, debuff or deband on yourself, so it doesn't matter as much. So the only other item that I would mention under uh, optimization is because of the fact that Fonural's ATP is so trash. <laughs> like, because like, look at this. She needs 580 ATP. Let's 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 just do a quick real time look up. What is the phone rules actual max ATP? It's 583. She can't use this until the end of the game. <laughs> like it's bad, chat. We were talking about it before. It is bad. So if you forgot how bad it was, you're gonna need potentially an alternate support item for like a majority of the game. And the way you can kind of go into that is with uh, Marina's bag. So if you are looking to do really early support stuff with Faux New Roll, ironically, she ends up being kind of bad for it just because she can't wield the support items that benefit her. But anyway, this gives a boosted range to Anti and Resta. She already has a good distance for Resta, but if you truly just want to heal the entire room, more importantly, probably the Anti is actually useful. Being able to get rid of uh, Paralysis full screen, I think, is more important than boosting her Resta range. This is one of the few ways in which you can do it. It also technically j gradually restores HP, which is pretty funny if you have that on and three seals as they just kind of have a battle with each other <laughs> of whether or not you're actually going to lose health, which I find very funny. But anyway, so let's very briefly cover the quality of life items. Cure units, basically everything other than your poison is useful. Heavenly HP, God HP is going to be the same across different characters. Now, when it comes to niche items, forces have a few unique ones. That being Demonic Fork, so if you don't want to use Cursed Cloak or... I guess technically... I don't, I don't feel like listing it. I mean, I could. Oh, fine, I'll go back and list it. There's also a Cursed Life Jacket. which allows for piercing Megid. Sadly, having multiple stacks of this doesn't really benefit anything. Oh, excuse me, it's not cursed. It's a dirty life jacket, excuse me. So, like, in theory, you could use these items. Dirty life jacket is a pretty easy pickup from quests, though. So I'd recommend you probably do that if you're looking to save some PDs over purchasing it. But definitely would recommend you get some piercing Megid option if you're looking to do... Episode 2 prior to Red Ring, I guess the best way of framing it. So they have that option in order to make sure that they could deal with Episode 2 earlier. Otherwise, they have something that I find kind of funny. Mercurius Rod gives a 30% bonus to Grants, but the real reason why people end up using this is the Gafoe special. So you would think that is a force. Your level 30 Gafoe equivalency should be superior, and there's no reason to use other Gafoe. But sadly, PSO cares more about how short the range of your Gafoe is versus long when it comes to stopping enemy charges. So if you want to consistently group annoying enemies like Zeus, Delbeaters, Dorfons, etc., uh, you will probably need to wield this at some point, use it special to put a fireball around you, and then watch them basically slam into it face first and protect yourself from harm. You can get away without using this item, but it requires very strict timing, whereas Mercurius Rod you just spam over and over, because you know it can't go more than a certain distance from you. There is a nice situational item with Galwind, which... Let me show this one since it's more important to read. This item allows you to basically drain your HP, and as stated here, which I do find really fun, and I should probably stream me using this item more often, Galwin can be used to activate mag triggers, so if you're playing with endgame mags that have anywhere between a 40 and 55% plus chance of invincibility when they hit max mag blast, it's really, really nice to be able to trigger it, or alternatively, 
uh, you can set yourself lower so that when you do get hit by set damage, you then take enough to trigger it, or you could just decide to be in a hallway, like, fishing for this before you come into a dangerous room. This has a lot of endgame use, but its payoff is really dependent on your ability to actually deal damage, or hopefully your team can, I guess. So we mentioned the simple tech items before, but the Club of Laconium is Foley, Zumarima is Zond, which is very, very, very niche. Honestly, I'm going to move this lower on the list. It's just very much not used that often. And finally, we have the uh, Club of Zumarinian, or excuse me, the Mace of Adamant, which is Barda, which I do use a lot, but it's probably a little less meta than Laconium versus Falls. Otherwise, we have the standard Resist Devil, Divine Protection. I will state from the standpoint of forces, if you're not going ATP force, it's pretty much recommended you just run PP creates and increases, because otherwise, if you don't do so, you're not going to be able to contribute mag blasts in longer quests. And forces are one of the few characters that could just kind of get away with it. Like, honestly, until you hit really high level, you're not really going to bother with V501 or V502 because your accuracy is just such trash. <laughs> like, let me be real honest. Like, you are not landing those specials early on. You are too... You are too widespread and dependent on your class levels in order to do anything. So if, you, if your dream is to be a level 120, like, V501 user, V502 to use arrests and stuff on characters, it's just not going to happen. You just need too many raw stats and you just level so slowly with it. Of course, once you get closer to like 160 or so and your ATA gets like a healthy 15 bump, you get like another 100 to 200 ATP, then, then it starts to matter a little more. But potentially trading in like a Heavenly Arms to hold a V501 and have a battle unit, and you might not even have enough HP to survive the set damage, depending on where you're at, it's pretty rough. So I would not rush into things like the V5 units, as good as they are. Horses can afford to wait, they have better things they can do with demons. Let's talk about their endgame items, and that will conclude the guide once we do so. So we have the core tech boosters, some of which are more expensive than others. So it depends on how badly you want to lean into MST as to where these items rank for you. I think Magical Piece is kind of a nice pickup for just general casting. Psycho Wand is an uber rare, so this item is crazy expensive. In fact, I might move these lower. I actually value them a little less than S rank. But Psycho Wand has the ability to buff all the raw techniques by 30%. The difference with Psycho Wand, though, is not only does it reduce TV cost by 50%, it does take it from your HP total. So, it is a bit risky to use earlier on, even if you somehow manage to get this for a lower level character. So just be aware of that. It is insanely strong, though, and on a phone new world, it's just devastating. I definitely wish I had one on Affinia, for sure. I feel sad, chat. Maybe one day. One of the only uber rares I'm interested in at this point. One day, chat. One day. Also, as a reminder, for all the weapons that are MST slash rods or canes, it absolutely does not matter what the attributes are on them. For other weapons, it does matter if it's machine or not or hit percentage. But just keep in mind, the others don't matter as much. So, endgame armors... Only difference is if you're looking to survive as the poor faux new role in anything anguish related potentially, or honestly even just early on, you could upgrade to virus armor from stink frame for raw defense. It's probably better on her than the other characters, just because she even with Jelen, she's still taking like 500 plus damage on like a Goron detonator crit. It's like actually insane how much damage she takes. So just be aware of that. I still consider that a meta choice for her. Although, preferably if you can, only use uh, elemental buffs on her. Otherwise, you have the PB generation of God Shield Koryu. I think forces, I would rate this a little lower than the other options, just because it's so easy to just slot in a PB create yourself. So, like an endgame build might be V101, V801, V502, or Adept. And if you don't need text at all, you would get rid of V801 for... 
I guess HP boosters. And if you're doing any kind of ranged attack at all, you need Smart Link. So I think we covered basically most of these items. I'll mention again Red Ring. We mentioned it by name several times throughout the guide. One last reminder, Chad. What a fantastic level difference. 180. This was about the level I started enjoying Fomar. I liked Fomar all before that. And this... And weirdly, I don't think I even enjoyed it 180 Fo Newman just because he didn't have enough ATP to use Excalibur still. So, I, I think it wasn't until like 183 or 184 he could use Excalibur. He was kind of painful, I'm not going to lie, for ATP. But for Fomarl and Fomar in particular, this is definitely a game changer shield. Pretty much best in slot all the time, just use ATP. Hmm. I already mentioned Girasol, Vivian, Brave. This got Brave Man with high hit, 13. The only thing that's a little different here, I would say, is probably for Fomar. There's a hard-to-get-with-hit percentage high enough item called the Guardiana. That is the dream. It has a pistol range. Cards have the benefit of doing 1-1-3, one, one, so the third attack hits three times. So potentially with Spirit and high accuracy, you could just kind of instantly delete enemies. But again, it requires very high hit percentage. There is an alternative to this with the s rank cards, or the ES cards, depending on how you want to describe them, from Challenge Mode. Since I believe the ES Challenge Mode cards can do the accuracy glitch of the SN or SNS, depending on what combo you're doing, in order to land the hits, to get around the fact they have lower accuracy, whereas Guardiana needs it. Which is a bit unfortunate. So yeah, otherwise, V502's 100% uh, chance to use Hell over V501's 50% chance to Hell, both of which granting 50% to Paralysis, uh, Confuse, and Freeze, of course, is one of the reasons why I don't even bother recommending V501 as you play at Force. Like, honestly, by the time you're able to say, I'm ready to be a Paralysis, like, support unit, or I'm gonna be spamming Hell consistently, most of the time, you're just going to be a high-level force anyway, so you're endgame. <laughs> you're, you just skip V501 for forces, I don't think it's worth it on them, and go straight to V502 if you're able to. Whereas other characters at least have the accuracy needed to use it in their common occurrence, and they get potentially bonuses towards it, forces don't get either. So don't, don't force the support option as force, it feels terrible with weapons. So, reminder, just really cheap. Uh, pickups if you can't get the challenge mode weapons. Ray gun with the rest, hell, and demons are basically the three guns you should have. Just gonna make a note here. Remind people that Bringer's Rifle exists because we mentioned that before. Otherwise, when it comes to the V502, uh, not all forces can use all weapons. I do find from the standpoint... Let me move things around slightly. Do I like that order? I'm gonna say pick one. I don't think you need all of these options, just for clarity. I think you should go very early on for... for Hell, because it is potentially useful for them to clear. So cards have that SN glitch so they, they could do it. Technically, Mech Gun's also not bad with them. I think the general preference, though, because it's usable across all character classes, are the challenge mode weapons to use Hell, since it's universal. Except on, po uh, except on poor Phone New World. She needs the cards with Hell. So just keep that in mind if you're sharing challenge mode weapons across characters. Otherwise, the demon mech guns are kind of sick. It is kind of a shame that they don't have like full usage across all the characters. So unfortunately, only the Newmans can use it, but one day, chat, my other goal is to see my phone new roll with the ES mech gun, because it would just be hilarious. So being able to demon enemies like that is pretty funny. You can also SN glitch with mech gun. 
if you're a decent distance away. So even though this has no accuracy and force accuracy is pretty terrible, uh, you can stand at specific distances in order to multi-hit, which is kind of nice. Otherwise, you get your standard uh, slicer combination for uh, hell. I actually want to check one thing here. Yeah, I think I could put that safely. So unfortunately, because it requires 800 ATP to use, it's not going to be something you're going to be grabbing early. I didn't feel it was as important to show with the other characters. It's generally, if you're going for challenge mode weapons, you're going to go for them. But I think from the standpoint of forces, because the ATP is so high, you don't really get to enjoy their endgame until like literally 180 plus. Whereas other characters can enter their early early endgame items as soon as like 130 or 140. So they, they just get a huge head start on the ATP slash special enjoyment. Otherwise, as I mentioned before, cards are just a really safe option. So you can put hell on them, demon, spirit, whatever you need in order to just kind of delete enemies. And we already talked about the core tech boosters. So otherwise, chat, I'll let you give some final thoughts if you want to add anything to the guide. But I think we covered every trading option. As a reminder for people, uh, this will be... Actually, it's already live, technically. I'm going to post it in the chat. For those that weren't in the Discord before, go ahead and go there now. But basically, all these items are just here as your reference to maybe give you an idea of like what endgame builds look like in a more simplified version. The video version of this guide is obviously going to be quite long because we're showcasing all the additional images. But from the standpoint of this, this particular document, you can just open this up. It's not going to go into a lot of verbiage since we cover that in all the other guides. But if you want to just listen to this, you want to jump to the appropriate section in the timestamps of the video itself. Hopefully this ends up being helpful to give you an idea of what items to look for. Now granted, this is not the end-all be-all. We don't cover things like cosmetics. That's covered in the other guide, to be honest with you. But from the standpoint of items that you need to climb and items that will at least get you through the ultimate so you can hunt your own stuff, I think this is a pretty solid selection of items. But I think otherwise, chat, I don't really have too much else to add to this. I think we're pretty much good to go. We'll give Chad a courtesy moment before we finally say goodbye to you two. Sounds like there's nothing to add. So that chat, we're gonna go ahead and close the god. We'll go to the let's chat. So if you did get to this point in the, the video or the VOD, I'd like to say thank you again for all the support. Hopefully this guide will help you between our earlier guides covering things like the climb from ultimate to ultimate to now trading, uh, potentially for new characters or for your current character. Hopefully this gives you an idea of what to look for, as well as what the trading environment is kind of like within Affinia. But otherwise, it's time to say goodbye. If you did watch to this point, again, thank you for watching. Hope to see you again in the next guide.